slide, would you? All right, we are starting. Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm. And I am here with Janice. I see her down below me. Hey, Janice. Hey, Greg. And this is Janice Norton coming from Two Piece in a Pod. I am an extension of the Urban Farm, just a little bit northwest of it. Excellent. And I'm here with Bell Starr and Bill McDormand. Welcome, Bill and Bell. Hey, hey, hey. We're in Cornville, Arizona, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, the nonprofit that we co founded. And we do a million things with Greg and Janice and Kari. <laughs> nice. And Speaking who of isn't Kari. here yet, who isn't here yet, because we, Kari and I, were recording a radio show until about uh, 25 minutes ago, uh, is Kari Spencer. So she, you will see her here shortly. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next. All right, perfect. So uh, the Great American Seed Up is the sponsor of this event. You can find out more information about it at greatamericanseedup.org. And what we did a few years ago, Bill and Bell and I and Kari, uh, what we did a few years ago is we started giving something called the Great American Seed Up. It's this bizarre in a room a 10,000 square foot room with over a hundred different varieties of open pollinated seeds that people can go in the room and scoop and bulk buy these seeds. And um, during that event, we always do education in every event that we do here at the Urban Farm and with the Great American Seed Up is education first. And I think you have something to share with us, Bill. About that comment about education first. Yeah. I. Um... It is education first. Bill and I have been involved in um, seed saving and, and nonprofit seed conservation organizations. Bill's been doing this work, <clears throat> excuse me, for 40 something years. But there's always this, we've had a little bit of feedback from people like, oh, you're trying to sell me something. Why didn't you let me know? Or, you know, this is a big sales pitch. No, we're going to give you an opportunity to get bulk seeds at incredibly low prices. And the um, thrust of this is education first and foremost. That's what we've always done. That's what we do. Yep. Um, our countless hours doing education and trying to get the information out there because that's what it's going to take to change the paradigm. So just so yeah. you know, up front, if there's any reservations at all, that somehow you're getting arm twisted to buy seeds, not the case. <laughs> Please join us for that's all this case. awesome education. And you will have an opportunity later today to buy, get an amazing deal on bulk seeds that are open pollinated that, yeah, we'll tell you all about that later. With the Until bonus. Then, with a bonus, absolutely with a bonus. Let's go to the next slide. All right, here's our team, Kari Spencer, myself, Bell Starr, Janice Norton, Bill McDormand, and Renee. Renee's a rock star. She's over on Facebook. So any of you that are over on Facebook, you'll get to uh, interact with Renee. We do take questions. We'll have a space here in a little while for Q&A. So the Q&A button is down at the bottom right of your screen, please shoot your questions to us that way. All right, next slide. Okay, today, here's what we're up for today. We have, oh my gosh, one, two, three, four, five. We have six classes that have all, uh, that we've all been, that we've been preparing for you, starting with creating your own varieties with uh, Kari Spencer. We have one on land race seeds. My gosh, what is that? That's with Bell and Joseph. We've got uh, Jillian with Urban Seed Saving. And uh, then Bill's going to do a uh, class on intro to seed patenting. What? What is that? <laughs> then we'll do a little bit of information. You get to see a quick video on Seed Up in a Box. Uh, and then we're going to be with uh, Rich Murphy on uh, seed saving and nonprofits. And then Bill's coming back for Gather, Grow, and Save Wild Seeds. Interestingly enough, in our Seed School Online course that we do, that is the most popular class on gra gathering, growing, and wi saving wild seeds. So, and then, then we'll do some live Q&A a couple of times and uh, like that. So I think we're there. Anything else, Janice, before we jump in? I had to tell you, this morning, as I was walking through my orchard, just kind of grounding myself for the day, I found mm -hmm. myself gathering seeds from flowers that were around my um, in my orchard mm -hmm. and reseeding them elsewhere. And I'm thinking, oh, Belle and Bill are going to be so proud of me. But it's become nice. so natural. I didn't even think right? about it till I was almost done. Awesome. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's part of us getting, and Bell, you, Bell, you can probably uh, relate to this because you, Bill's been into seeds all his life, practically. You came to it, what, 20 years ago, maybe? And, uh, you know, it just becomes second nature for us. You know, it's something that we just automatically do, which right. is cool. And if you're seeing, so here's a, here's a tip for uh, something else that we have coming up in the future. We've got a, an event, our uh, water harvesting summit. Maybe Janice, you can put the link in the chat box. Okay. Um, and uh, the backyard, Janice is gonna do a presentation on her backyard. That's Janice's backyard now. Four years ago, it was a dirt backyard. So that's been an amazing transformation. So if you wanna see that, check out the, uh, link that Janice is going to post for us. And I think with that, um, let's see, I think maybe, maybe. I'm is so excited about what Kari is teaching about making yeah. your own varieties. Oh, yes. this is so fun. Yeah. Hey, Kari, Kari's Hi. in the room. Hey, you made it. Very good. That was, that was a tight ship this morning, huh, Kari? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we're going to mute everybody and turn everybody's video off and we're going to jump in with Kari's video. Kari Spencer is an instructor with Urban Farm U and a long and a longtime advocate for urban farming. Um, really well, a uh, really big advocate for urban farming. She is the author of City Farming, the how-to guide to raising, growing food and raising livestock in urban spaces. Her practical, cheerful tutorials and tips for urban farmers and aspiring gardeners can be found at cityfarmingbook.com. All right, we're going with the video and then we'll come back and do Q&A afterwards, Kari. So happy to be here today to talk with you about plant breeding and to introduce the possibilities for gardeners and farmers to develop their own plant varieties. In other words, we're gonna explore the possibilities inherent in natural plant breeding, which I find to be very exciting. What is plant breeding? In brief, it is the promotion or the minimization of specific traits by crossing two parent plants to produce offspring that meets the gardener's tastes and needs. In this case, a disease resistant tomato is crossed with a better tasting tomato in hopes to achieve a tomato that is both disease resistant and tasty. Crossing varieties is called hybridization and the resulting offspring are called hybrids. There are many ways to generate new plants, such as root division, layering, cuttings, grafting, but the most common method for backyard farmers and gardeners is seed saving. Anytime you collect, save, and plant seeds from your own garden, you're breeding plants. Plant breeding by saving seeds is an intuitive process for many gardeners, and they may be doing it unawares. Other gardeners are more intentional, purposefully, saving seeds from their very best plants, i.e. those that thrived and produced a harvest that pleased them. By becoming a more intentional seed saver and becoming a little bit pickier about which seeds you save for planting, you can influence offspring to adapt to the climate and the growing conditions in your garden and to meet your taste for flavor, color, texture, or any other preference that you hold. No seed type is off limits for seed saving as long as you understand the results. Heirloom and heritage seeds are often favorites for seed savers because they breed true, meaning the offspring will be very similar to the parent. Collecting and planting wild seed can be more unpredictable, but very interesting to grow. Hybrid seeds produce offspring that may be very different from the parent expressing traits inherited from previous generations that were not evident in the parent plants. I did not include genetically modified seeds in the list. These are referred to as GMOs and GMO seed is not generally available to backyard gardeners, but they can sneak into the gene pool in various ways. For gardeners who are concerned about GMOs, it may be a good idea to look into which varieties may contain GMO material. I skipped over landrace seeds, which may or may not be familiar. Landraces are plants that have been cultivated long enough in a given region to adapt to the climate, growing conditions, and preferences of the farmers. They're stable, meaning they tend to breed true, 
while simultaneously being able to change and adapt. This is because they are much more genetically diverse than standardized breeds. Genetic diversity gives them the capacity to tolerate stress and adjust quickly to climatic conditions of any locality. There are many approaches to seed saving and plant breeding, but I want to touch on two of them today, the two that I use most in my garden. Before we begin to talk about methods, though, there are a couple of important plant characteristics to note. First, understand how plants are typically pollinated. Some plants have what we call perfect flowers, containing both male and female parts within every flower. These plants, like tomatoes and beans, self-pollinate and very little crossing occurs. Other plants, like asparagus, require cross-pollination, namely the transfer of pollen from a male plant to a female plant. A third category has separate female flowers and male flowers growing on the same plant. These plants can be fertilized by their own pollen, but they readily cross pollinate. Squash, cucumbers, and melons fall into this category. It's also important to know which plants will cross pollinate and which won't. It's quite easy. If you know the botanical or Latin names of the plants that you grow, you know whether or not they will cross. Okay, plants with the same Latin name will cross and plants with different Latin names will not. For example, Armenian cucumbers and cantaloupes are very different, but they share the same Latin name so they can cross. On the other hand, market more 76 cucumbers and Armenian cucumbers look and they, their names sound similar, but they have different Latin names and they won't cross. Knowing this information is useful when planning which varieties to grow and where they will be located in your garden. Equipped with knowledge concerning pollination, we can begin to experiment with simple plant breeding. I prefer the laid back method, which you may already be doing. The method has three intentional steps, beginning when your garden plants are mature and setting seed. Collect seed from your very best plants those that are strongest, highest producing, or that you like the best for whatever reason. Save these seeds and plant them the following season. Some of the plants will closely resemble the parent plants. Others will be very different from their parents. And a few may be even better than their parents. Again, collect seeds from the best plants, save them, Plant them, repeat. Gradually, your garden will become adapted to your climate and growing conditions, as well as your tastes and preferences. You may also want to try your hand at strategic plant breeding, which is useful if you have two related plants that you love and want to combine specific traits in a single new variety. In the example pictured, the mother tomato plant has orange oblong tomatoes. And as we discussed before, she is highly disease resistant. The father has a red tomato. And as we discussed before, uh, he's tastier. The goal is to cultivate a tomato plant that exhibits the disease resistance inherited from the mother and the round shape of the father plant. Pollen is collected from the male plant and used to fertilize the female plant. Plants are saved from the mother and planted the following season. Offspring plants grow and are pollinated by the same variety of father plants. And again, the best seeds are saved and planted. The process repeats until the generations eventually produce a disease resistant tasty tomato. This particular example is extremely simplified for illustration purposes. It's helpful to know some basics of plant breeding if you want to try your hand at it. There are many books and plenty of information on the web that will provide further basic plant breeding education. It's also okay to simply experiment and you can eat the tomatoes that don't make the cut.
Results require patience. When you cross-pollinate varieties, the genetic changes do not begin to show up until the next generation. For example, if I have two watermelon varieties that each possess a trait that I love, I can attempt to cross them. Let's say I pollinate a large, less flavorful watermelon plant with pollen from a small, sweeter variety, and all I get is the same large, less flavorful melons in that first crop. I'm not discouraged because I know that when I collect seeds from those large melons that have been fertilized by the smaller ones and I plant them the next season, I will surely see the results of my efforts. I'd be disappointed with the result if I was confused thinking the fruit, in this case the melon, was the offspring. Note that the melon is the mother and thus it will look like the mother variety. The offspring are seeds and the plants that grow from them will begin to show the changes. A few of the offspring may achieve the objective of being both large and sweet, or at least closer to the goal. Others will fail to achieve the objective. Although you may not want to save seeds from the so-called failures, you can still eat and enjoy them. So remember, the offspring is not the melon. The melon is the mother. The offspring are the seeds. In other words, the babies are in the melon. Expect the unexpected. Perhaps your broccoli is pollinated by a bee that visited your neighbor's cauliflower. Seeds saved from your broccoli will grow into something in between a broccoli and a cauliflower. Surprise! So-called accidents can happen in the garden. When you're saving seeds, the mother plant variety is always obvious. But father plants can be a mystery. The photo here shows what I can only guess is a cross between a cantaloupe and an Armenian cucumber. In this case, the result was not delicious and the seeds were not saved from these cantacumbers. Or are they cucumelons? Parents and children can differ widely in their traits. In humans, like my daughter and my granddaughter's hair in this photo. And they also differ in plants, such as the example of the pea flowers. The mother is white, the offspring is purple, and the color of the father is unknown. In this case, however, the mystery father is purple. I'll tell you that secret. Thus, the purple offspring. Unless you're trying to breed a specific variety or are producing commercial seed that requires uniformity, cross-pollination is good, genetic diversity is great. Without it, plants cannot readily adapt to changes in their environment. Conversely, a large gene pool facilitates rapid adaptation to climate changes and other stressors. Growing a wide selection of similar but not identical varieties leads to some surprises, but it also will provide more genetic opportunity for your plants to adapt to the specific conditions in your garden with ever increasing vigor and performance. So save your seeds. Not only does it cost less than buying seed every season, it also is the easiest method of breeding for adaptation to your specific growing conditions, climate, and taste. You will likely end up with more seed than you can plant. Save some seed, swap the rest with other gardeners. Not only is it a fun activity, exchanging seed helps to improve both gardeners' gardens. If you cannot find a seed library or someone local with whom to swap, Take your search online to gardening groups on social media or websites dedicated to swapping seeds, such as Seed Savers Exchange at seedsavers.org. Another wonderful resource with a similar URL, seedsave.org, has a great list of bioregional seed companies if you want to buy a few seeds to add to your gene pool. And by the way, if you want to learn to save seeds and dive deeper into the history, science, business, and craft of seeds, SeedSave offers a popular seed school. Both Seed Savers and Seed Save are fantastic organizations with lots of resources for seed savers. If you are attempting to do some targeted breeding, 
Don't fret if the results are way off the results that you were attempting to achieve. This happens to professional breeders sometimes too. Savor the experiences and the surprises. Learn as you go, eat the mishaps, and expect some happy accidents to occur that you never would have chanced upon if you only grew standard varieties year after year. The bottom line for me is that seed saving is an adventure. It's truly gratifying to watch your garden steadily evolve and improve by the simple act of saving and planting your own seeds. There really are no mistakes, just opportunities to expand genetic diversity and to learn. It's not just your plants that will become stronger. You too are evolving, learning and becoming a better gardener. And who knows, perhaps you'll light upon a powerhouse variety. Go to greatamericanseedup.org to start your seed saving journey or to expand it with adaptable non-GMO heirloom seeds. Thanks for listening and happy gardening. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Kari. We're gonna take questions after this next uh, lecture that we have. And this is actually a uh, interview. Bell is gonna interview Joseph Lofthouse. Bell Starr is the co-founder of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and previous deputy director. Hold on, I lost my place here. Uh, director uh, at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Sorry about that. Uh, Bell and Bill McDormand founded Seed School on, in 2010 and Seed School Online, which has graduated more than 1,200 students throughout the world. Didn't know that. That's cool. And Joseph Lofthouse is a farmer and a yoga teacher and has found great solace in monastic practices. All these things inform his relationship to his plants and the projects that evolve. He is a contributor to Mother Earth News and is excited to announce the release of his new book, Land Race Gardening. What is Land Race Gardening? I think we're gonna find out. His book is Land Race Gardening, Food Security Through Biodiversity and Promiscuous Pollination. Take it away, Belle and Joseph. I'd like to welcome Joseph Lofthouse to Seed Up Saturday. Joseph, it's so wonderful to see you always. Thank you, Belle, wonderful to see you. We have a little bit of history, I guess now, huh? Since we <laughs> met at the first seed school that you attended, and I was trying to remember when that was. Was that 2015 or 16? Do you know? I, maybe I shouldn't have put you on the spot. I, well, it was probably 2000, was it even 2014? Uh, could have been, yes, yes, yes. When we just started the Rocky mm -hmm. Mountain Seed Alliance. And the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is a partner in uh, the uh, Seed Up Saturday. So that's appropriate to mention the great, the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Right. So, yes, so it could have been 2014 and uh, we did a seed school in Idaho and we literally drug Joseph there because we had heard such incredible things about him. And we got on the phone and we said, you are coming and we don't care if we have to go get you, you are coming and, and it's been, uh, been a wonderful marriage ever since, so to speak. You've taught with us, you've, um, you've gone to our events and contributed, you've been on our seed school teacher training online, you've just done all these wonderful things, and you've written a new book. And I'm not, I'm not trying to ascribe all your wonderful credits to Rocky Mountain Sea Alliance or the people involved. I'm just saying that that's how we know you, and you've, got, you've had history way back when. You've been doing this work, this seed work, for years and years, and we'll talk a little bit about th that. Your new book is called Land Race Gardening, Food Security Through Biodiversity and Promiscuous Pollination. Right. You wanna, you wanna <laughs> hold up the book? That's a mouthful. There it is. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, great. So um, we're gonna talk about land race gardening because that's not a word that everybody knows or land race. And really what I'd love for you to comment on is this idea of promiscuous pollination. People in the outside world, and in other words, people who aren't involved in seeds and um, seed breeding and agriculture, they hear that word and they can't help but giggle, promiscuous <laughs> pollination. So give us a little snapshot of what you see, your interpretation of promiscuous pollination. 
So, so my idea of gardening is that plants ought to be cross-pollinating. And in the seed industry, we have this term that's called open pollination. And people believe that that means, oh, you know, they're free and they're, they're genetically diverse. But what happens with open pollination is every trick known to mankind is used to prevent the seeds from cross-pollinating. And so they get more and more inbred each generation. And so I chose the term promiscuous pollination to say, we really want these plants to be cross-pollinating because if they're cross-pollinating, then they can become locally adapted. They can adjust to the climate, to the bugs, to the farmer's habits. And, and so I, and of course, it's a little bit uh, provocative, but it, Right. Uh, I'm a bit of an iconoclast, and so there you go. Oh, yeah, you are. And the whole idea of inbreeding, you know, in this notion of inbreeding depression, people in the seed world use that word. And that means when you, when you breed something that's the same, the same variety with each other, that um, over time it loses that, uh, abun that uh, robustness, that um, the right. diversity, the, the health of the plant. Yes. Basically, if you if you breed it, it's like um, like dogs, people, you know, we can relate to dogs. You breed dogs uh, of the same uh, species. If you breed too many shepherds, they end up with hip dysplasia. Right. Over uh -huh. time, because that's one of their um, genetic issues. So, yeah. OK, good. Right. So, and, with, and with plants, they might end up with, say, blossom and rot or right, they, might, disease. they might not know how to deal with white flies or whatever. Wow. The specific issue is. So I was looking through your book and you say that you don't, um, I love the term, I love your term and I, I, I will have to find it here that, um, I, uh, oh, I do not coddle plants. So in other words, when you're looking for plants to work with, to save the seeds from because they're, they're healthy and strong, you're not out there coaxing these babies along to make them grow by all kinds of things, inputs and, and different strategies right, I, and covers. I, and tell us about I, your philosophy with that. So I don't, I want strong plants. I want plants that know how to, what my habits are, what my climate is. And I want them just to grow without me getting in the way. I don't want to pay money for fertilizers and I don't want to poison myself and I give my plants water and let them have sunshine. And if they can't deal with that, they should find another place to grow because it's not <laughs> with me. Okay. And so then the, the whole idea of that is that, that the plants do adapt and they do get healthy. And so this is really important with people who want to save seeds is that, and I always think about the things that show up, the volunteers that want to be where they grow. Those seem to me to be the best expression of what you're saying. So I have, I've got a, a sunflower in the middle of the gravel where we walk back and forth uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not babying it, but I'm trying not to walk on it. And right. I'm just, and I do give it a little bit of water cause it's outside of the watering zone and I'm just going to let it go and see what happens, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, what's the upshot of that? You end up with this plant that wants to be there. That's managing its own interface with the environment uh -huh. and, and hopefully creating lots of little baby sunflowers that, you know, through the seeds that you can keep. Right. Yeah. And you might end up with sunflower weeds in your gravel. <laughs> the sunflower. That's right. Right. Oh, that would be a horrible problem. So that's, that's another thing we could talk about too, is this reframe, right? You're a, you and Bill McDorman, who's one of the principals in the Great American Seed Up and Seed Up Saturday and certainly co-founder of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, you guys all are all about letting everything cross as often as possible, right? Right. And the reason is? Well, because they're stronger that way. Because even though, each plant has a little piece of a puzzle, and when you combine several different pieces together, you get resistance to bugs, to soil, to the climate, whatever. And so, so in, in response to those who say, but don't we want to breed things or grow things true to form? So um, in other words, if I'm growing um, 
a better boy tomato and I save the seeds, I want it to be better boy tomato, right? And so I want to try to manage for that. There are people well, who say there's value in that, right? There is value in that. For example, I like my hot peppers or I like my sweet peppers to always be sweet peppers. I don't want any hot peppers at all in my in my sweet peppers, but I don't care if they're yellow or red or orange. And I don't care if the shape's long and skinny or short and fat. I just want a sweet pepper, you know, but but I could also have consistency like in a squash if I always want a yellow crooknet. I could grow a genetically diverse yellow crooknet. And I do, but I, I let the leaf shape be anything it wants to be. And it can be a, a viney plant or it can be short and squat. But I always want it to be yellow and crooked. Right. So, so you're selecting for very specific things. And you, I would say that um, you have been a market farmer. But as a market farmer, have you had to educate your customers about, oh, yeah, that is that is a crook, not, crook neck. It may not look like it or, you know, um, well, the peppers. Well, yes, like if eventually people come to trust that anything that I brought to market, it would taste wonderful. It would be easy to use in the kitchen. And they, they would buy anything I offered just because it was me that was offering it. But yeah, I mean, if a, if a squash is round or if a squash has a long neck and it's a butternut, it tastes the same either way, you know, and there, and there might be some advantages to having the long neck because you can cut it into slices and have little round discs that you put on your grill, where with the round squash, it's harder to do that. Right. You know, but that, those are mostly cosmetic issues. They're not flavor or health or health, health yeah. anything like that so yeah i always think about that i remember when we did a seed school at prescott college once and we were talking to the kids who did the market farm there and we were actually trying to help them understand the value of seed saving and and they said well we you know all the typical responses right we don't have time we don't have the space it doesn't make sense. We want everything to grow true to form. We can't guarantee it. But their one issue predominantly is they wanted everything to look the same because that's how people expect the food to look, right? right. And so we have to, we have a little bit of a reframe to do. And it's um, uh, in many ways, in many ways mm -hmm. about, our, about our interface with gardening. And especially if you're a seed saver, you know, you've got to make sure that you can live with something like like um this you see this that that's the same shot of uh -huh. the sunflowers right in the background right. and that that's okay it's not messy it, you know we like that because it's <laughs> it's our opportunity to collect seeds etc so in right. your book you also and, and i think that also could relate to the idea of having less stress in your life and and not having to coddle everything and manage everything and i i've always liked that word man age <laughs> manage everything so it all works out quote perfectly so you say by growing my own land raised seeds i eliminate stresses i don't have to worry about paying for seeds poisons fertilizers um, records or pedigrees are optional i don't have to keep seeds pure or isolated i can save seeds from hybrids and let varieties get all mixed up I, I don't get out of kilter when the seed catalog drops my favorite variety or if a variety name or story gets lost, I don't worry about getting a harvest. I don't, I don't worry about supply chain interruptions. That's a big thing for people to understand that, you know, we can garden everything. And you actually have a, a, a section in the book called land race. Um, is it? Oh, land race everything. Everything. Trees, chickens, I would say dogs and cats. <laughs> Just let everything, so everything interbreed <laughs> and get mixed up. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh gosh, I love that. And of course, we just discussed the value of that. And it's, it is a reframe. You have to think differently. Um, and the benefits are just so incredible. Um, 
In the back of the book, you have a list of the varieties that are easy to develop into land races. You know, we didn't even talk about the actual definition of a land race. So why don't you touch on that, that and then um, tell us how we might work with a variety to help it morph into a land race. Yes, yeah, so, so my definition of a land race is it's a variety that is locally ad adapted, genetically diverse and promiscuously pollinated. And it's intimately connected with the farmer and the community where it's growing in. And so any crop that is highly cross-pollinating is, is an excellent crop to start developing a land race with because the high genetic or the high uh, incidence of crossing means that the genetics is rearranging quickly in order to to more to tune in quicker to the local conditions mm -hmm. and so you so you know i always think about land races i mean if you pick up any seed catalog you will see land races in there and those are some of the some of the seeds that have just been around for a very long time mm -hmm. that have worked in a multitude of situations you can find them in any catalog really across the board mm -hmm. you know it might be um uh california wonder pepper or you know better boy tomatoes or you know iceberg lettuce or something like that i mean there's just you know i don't know if iceberg is, is a land race but you get my point. So, so if you were working with, I know I'm looking at your list of ease of developing land race crops. You've got fava, runner, corn, cucumber, melon, spinach, squash, and and even turning those into um, into land race that uh, originate as hybrids, which is a whole other topic that we will take on our next conversation, perhaps. Um, <laughs> so, so what makes it you know, give me give me a a quick thumbnail of how one would make these how these would be coaxed into being quote land race crops. So so I'll I'll give a squash as much as an example of a, a way that I developed a land race. I was growing Burgess Buttercup, which is a round squash with a, a little button on the end of it, and it was always green. And one year something cross-pollinated with it which is probably red curry and so it, it brought a red color into the squash and i just saved the seeds and planted it anyway because it tasted great it looked great and so i just started growing that squash and and so then i would have squash that would be either red or green or they'd be striped with red and green and then if about three, four years later, a Hopi white squash crossed into it and it brought a pale white color. And so, so then it still tasted great. It still had the same shape, but now it had skin color that was, was light green or dark green, light orange or dark orange. So combining with, with all of those, then I have six different colors of squash. They all taste great, they all look great, they grow fantastic, no coddling at all. And so, so that was a, an easy way to develop a, a land race. Um, sometimes so I've been more intentional about it. For example, with watermelon, I planted hundreds of varieties of watermelon and I harvested five, fruits from five of the varieties. Now that was a more difficult and hard crop to work with for me. But so the one was a slow and steady approach of just saving seeds and and stuff happens. And the other was an intense, I'm gonna, you know, combine all these varieties and see what happens. Wow. And so that takes patience, time, you know, a different mindset than than some certainly than the gardening that we hear about often. Right. Well, what it means is that the variety becomes my variety, it becomes my community's variety. It's something that 
I'm going to be growing for the rest of my life. You know, and, and that's much different than just getting a catalog and, and buying random varieties every single year. It, One thing that I, I really enjoy about land race gardening is that it's a community effort because I take I take squash to the farmer's market, I take cantaloupes, and I have a standing rule, a request that if somebody gets the fruit and the taste is just super amazing. That they bring seeds back to me because that way the community is helping to develop the variety helping to bring tastes in that we just love and adore so yeah again it's 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 a real um gesture of love basically right and heart and heart and soul and a connection with the with the seeds other than commodifying them as um you know something that we just use and use the next year and give you know it becomes part of the whole ecological process and cycle which is it is we've just forgotten that mm -hmm. so we're just about ready to wrap up here and i want to give you a chance to to um single out anything in particular that you would like to feature from the book or anything that you would like to say to our amazing audience out there so if there's any thing that I really value about the book, it is the promiscuous tomato chapter. Because well, here's a pedigree, I don't know if it can show up, but it, it shows the many to many relationships between between uh, a land race project compared to the like the lineal descendant of a of a domestic tomato breeding project. And I, I really think there's a lot of value in changing the whole idea about how we grow tomatoes to have them be cross-pollinating crop, like 100% cross-pollinating, 30% cross-pollinating, so that they can get their genetics mixed up and solve those problems for themselves that we're currently trying to solve with poisons or labor or materials and i hope to recruit lots of people to participate in in the promiscuous tomato project wow and so you're doing hand pollinating because tomatoes no, are, no? i well we have done hand pollinating like in greenhouses during the winter so we can get an extra generation but we're allowing promiscuous pollination from bumblebees Whoa, because I wasn't I wasn't aware that they they can pollinate that cross pollinate that easily, but you plant them all together. Well, the thing is the these tomatoes I'm working with have flowers that are huge. And and the, I saw that the, in the book, yeah. Those have little little dinky flowers. And so so the they're really attractive to bumblebees and digger bees and micro bees that I don't have names for. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and so, so mostly the strategy we've, we've ended up with is we're going to select for big, beautiful, open flowers so that even if we don't know the, say, the genetics specifically of the flower, we know that it's big and bold and it's calling to the pollinators. That's what you want. Wow. Mm -hmm. So how do people reach you? Where do they get the book? So I can be reached at lofthouse.com. Perfect, lofthouse.com. Yes, and there's a, a sign up form there to be notified when the book is released, which is currently with beta readers and an editor. So it should be soon. Oh my gosh, you must be incredibly excited. I am so happy. Yeah, what a project. Oh I'm my gosh. Like Your baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dear, I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your incredible work with uh, the with Seed Up Saturday and the Great American Seed Up, and we appreciate you, and we'll look forward to uh, the further adventures and hearing from you again, especially as the uh, the book is released and you receive more accolades and have great success. Thank, thank you, Belle. You've been a joy in my life, and mm. you've helped me 
to improve as a farmer and as a seed keeper. And mm, thank you, babe. Love you. Really appreciate it. Joseph Lofthouse. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's time. We're going to do some Q and A. So let's bring Kari on and Bell on. Uh, that was uh, an amazing interview. Thanks for doing that, Bell. All right, I'm sure they'll be here. Um, we do have uh, uh, our sponsor today is Great American Seed Up. That is an, or, uh, an organization that Bill and Bell and Kari and Janice and I created over the past seven years to help people get um, open pollinated bulk seeds. So um, let's see here. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Bell and Kari. Here I am. Here I am. Here, here I go. am. Oh, very good. So we have some um, interesting questions. There's Kari. Uh, we might even think about, well, we'll start with us and see if we need to push them off hmm, to, well, to, to Bill. Yeah, I think so. We're gonna need, um, the, big, we're gonna need the big dog. All right, <laughs> so here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing that um, is gonna tax your brain on how well you were listening. Can, you, can he repeat, can we repeat the three things that Joseph just said about what makes a land race seed? I know one of them was open, open, he said promiscuous. Um, I did look up while we were, uh, while we were listening, I did look up the definition of land race seed. Uh, land race plants are grown from seeds which have not been systematically selected and marketed by seed companies. When I was getting my uh, bachelor's degree in bo uh, botany in 2003, I took a class and we concentrated on land race. And um, basically the land race uh, are the original seeds, they called them. They're the seeds that, uh, you know, that, that were here before we started messing with them. Uh, Lisa says locally adapts. Oh, Lisa, you rock. Locally adapts. This is what Joseph said, locally adapts, genetically diverse, promiscuous pollinator. Good job. I love that. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Can we just blast through some of these other questions too? Boy, there's a bunch yeah. of them here and see what uh, we can cover. Maybe, maybe go for the- Well, can somebody un, uh, make it so my video works? I can't come back. Oh. Please come back. Ask to start video. See if that works. There it is. Hey, there we go. And then change his name too, just for the heck of it. Oh, but if both Bill and Bell, it, there you go. Thanks, Bell. Um, ah, Dottie wants to know what the difference is between land race and heirloom seeds. Sorry, or Bill. Uh, just a second. Um, well, they don't have. There doesn't have to be any difference. Uh -huh. If you go if you go back and try to find out where the word land race when it was first started being used, it was in the 30s and the 40s, uh -huh. when for the first time Mendel's um, laws of genetics were being used in universities to create new varieties used using what we call modern plant breeding. These were very systematic for the first time attempts to make more uniform and to breed in specific characteristics into our crops. And so all the stuff that was left out of this process, all the old things, all the things that peasants had, all the things that gardeners had grown and saved on their own, all of those were generally put in a category called land race, all right? And so, you know, the most important part of that is that they're uh, naturally adapted um, promiscuously pollinating, as Joseph said, and they were all specific to different places. And I think that's where the most important part of that definition, what it means. Um, heirlooms are um, treasures. The, out of that whole process, we have individuals, especially gardeners that say, oh, this is, my grandfather passed this down to me and then it came to my father and then he gave it to me. And so this is my heirloom treasure seed. And so they can be the same thing, actually. They're just two different descriptions used sometimes for the same things. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So this question will be for uh, Kari and Bill. I'll let you guys arm wrestle over it. 
Uh, Stephen wants to know, he says, I've never planted hybrid plants or hybrid seeds. Not sure how to do it. Are the two seeds, plant, are the two seeds planted physically next to one another? And can it be done, can, I guess, growing hybrids, uh, can it be done in hydroponics? Yes, I would say in hydroponics, but um, growing hybrids, Kari and Bill? Uh, no difference. <laughs> You know, in fact, most of what um, gardeners are offered in the United States now are hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, it, and the, the, the law is that it, um, when you buy a variety of vegetable, it either has to, if it is a hybrid, it means it has to either say hybrid on the packet or F1. That's a shorthand mm. for filial one or first generation offspring after a planned cross between two inbred parents. That's kind of the definition of a hybrid. So hybrid, it's, uh, it's really possible that the majority, if you're a gardener, that the majority of uh, things that you've planted in your life are hybrids. So there's no real difference in growing them. Now you can save seeds from hybrids in the same way you'd save seeds from anything. And Joseph sort of described that process. So no problem. How about the homo homozygous genes for some traits? Bill, can you mute too when you're not speaking, please? And Kari's muted for some reason while we're not hearing her. Hmm. The first question was about homozygous genes. So I'm gonna mute Bill and you can unmute. Um, so that question, Bill, uh, so oh. is Joseph selecting for homozygous genes for some traits and leaving the rest heterozygous? Um, I, I think there's a little bit of um, a misunderstanding on the definitions of homozygous and heterozygous. What homozygous means is that you have the same two traits at the same location. In other words, they're either both dominant or both recessive. So he could be selecting for homozygous in the case that um, he is selecting for a recessive because that's the only way he would see a recessive. Otherwise, he's just selecting for <clears throat> the dominant trait, which could be either homozygous or heterozygous. So there would be no way to tell without a genetic test. So it just depends on what he's, he's doing both basically. All right, you had something you were gonna share. <laughs> I wasn't sure of the question where the, um, the question asker said, do you have to plant both seeds next to each other for a hybrid uh, plant? Yes. Well, it, you know, if you buy hybrid seed, you only, you only need one seed to grow the hybrid plant because they've already crossed them. And then Got you it. get seed for it. How do we get seeds out of a hybrid? How do you get seeds out of a hybrid? Yeah. Save them. They have to, well, they have to pollinate, don't they? Well, oh, sure. <laughs> almost all plants will allow at least some self-pollination. So even if you only have one plant and it's a cross-pollinating plant, you'll still get some seeds usually. And nature's way more, you know, they're in the air, there's insects, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So you have to, uh, you'll probably always get seeds. Now, the question is whether or not they'll be good. And so what do you mean by good? For me, good means, I'm like, Joseph, it tastes good. I don't care what it looks like. It grows well in my garden. It may look nothing like the parents. If your definition of good is uniformity, you want it to look exactly like the Market Moore 76 cucumber that you planted or whatever it is, whatever the hybrid is, then um, it may not be good for you. And that's, that's why generally hybrid seed is not saved. It's if you're a big farmer, you have to have it uniform. So there, there, no way they're going to save or use seeds from hybrids. But home gardeners, we can be more playful, like Joseph, and just see what happens. And oftentimes, um, I like to think that really great things will happen. Cool. So maybe for Kari, I have two varieties of tomatoes planted next to each other, and so can I let the bees cross pollinate them? Well, you can, but they be, but bees don't cross pollinate tomatoes very well because tomatoes are self pollinating, and the pollen is 
and the uh, over, ovary are in the same flower, right? Mm. And it's closed up. So there is some cross pollination that happens between tomatoes just naturally, but most of it is them self pollinating. So if you wanna be sure you're gonna get a good cross, you can open up one tomato and take the pollen out and insert it on the pistil of the oh. other plant. So you have, but you need to know a little bit about flower anatomy, right? In order to do that, but it's, it's simple. I just use a swab or a paintbrush to do that. It's if, if you really want to do that, get the young person in your life that takes apart iPhones, because it's just about the same sort of thing. You need a, a an, an eyeglass, it's, you know, they're pretty small. And so, and then I thought just in Joseph's lecture, it was really interesting because what he's doing, and this will help explain it, is he's been finding and selecting for tomatoes that have open flowers. That's just another trait. So most tomato flowers are all closed up. So the pollination takes place inside. Car is right before it even opens. But what happens if there are open flowers so bees can get in there? And that's what he's looking for because he wants to mix things up better. Cool. Um, so here's an interesting question for both of you. Which traits are easier to control? Can you give an example? That's a great question, <laughs> Bill. Bill? Give up, it's all uncontrollable. <laughs> um, you know, generally, it's nature controls traits by making one dominant and one recessive. Mm -hmm. So over time, the dominance will become the, the standard. That it, in some ways, we, we um, use the word healthy if there's lots mm -hmm. of dominance. It's when we have recessives old traits that no longer fit within their ecosystem or cause, uh, you know, we can't really explain them that we call something unhealthy. And so um, now though, if you're looking for disease resistance, and this has happened in the history of agri industrial agriculture, especially, turns out that sometimes disease resistance is now a recessive trait. And they have to bring that into a modern crop. They don't want to give up all the other breeding they've done on their crop, but they want this disease resistance in. And there's actually a pretty um, systematic and uh, predictable way to bring those genes in using back crossing. And so some, there may be a professor or a scientist out there going, oh, no, no, you know, I can actually bring recessive traits in, but you've got to know what you're doing. And that's where you would go to the university and learn plant breeding probably. Cool. Well, thank you, thank you. We're gonna do more Q&A in a bit. Um, I'm, we've got lots more questions here. We're gonna try and get to them all uh, a little later on. But in the meantime, we are going to jump over to our next presenter. Uh, that is Jillian Bishop. She is the founder of Urban Tomato in Ontario, Canada. Her 750 square foot backyard is a seed company. She is out to prove that you don't need thousands of acres or contracts with China to have a successful bioregional seed company. She carefully curates an heirloom collection of seeds specific to her bioregion. So that's cool. She is a great educator and thinks seed saving is, ne is necessary for everyone who gardens. Take it away, Jillian. Welcome, welcome everybody. We are here today with Jillian Bishop with the Urban Tomato. She's going to be talking about saving seeds in urban environments. Welcome, Jillian. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, thanks for being here. This is <laughs> such an important topic. Let's just go ahead and jump in. I'm going to start by giving just a little bit of a, a context about myself, sharing a, a little story about how I came into this. And within that, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the benefits of urban seed saving and, and some of the work that can sort of uh, ripple outwards from, from doing uh, seed saving within cities. So this picture here is uh, me smiling, happily harvesting some quinoa that I grew in a, a local community garden. And as you can see, it's sort of right in front of a, a tall apartment building. So I feel that symbolizes urban seed saving. I do 
run a small heirloom seed company called Urban Tomato. Uh, it has always been concentrated on growing and saving seeds in an urban environment, but also really values teaching other people how to save seeds along the way. So I very much see those, those two things working together. Some people in my life told me, why would you teach people to save seeds? Because you're going to put yourself out of business. But you know, <laughs> so far that has uh, not happened. And in fact, I've only seen that the interest grow. And if I were to put myself out of business from so many people saving their own seeds, I would consider that far more a win than a loss. Happy to continue teaching people along the way. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> from, Thank you. For most of the time that I was saving seeds, I was a landless farmer. I borrowed people's land. So I worked with local farmers. I grew in community gardens, containers, fire escapes, anywhere I could possibly save seeds. Uh, and this taught me a lot about building connections and partnering with other people and, and building a community around seed saving. So many of us know that diversity is incredibly important in seed saving. And, and I would argue uh, the people that you're saving seeds with is also important to have a diversity of folks that you're working with. Um, I share this story just because I think a lot of people think you need to have acreage or a massive space in order to be able to grow and save seeds, but I have found that not to be true. You can certainly see I have fermenting tomatoes in sun porches of my house. I've done winnowing off my fire escape and every surface of my home is, is covered in seeds at basically all time. Even in the background here, I have seedlings sprouting. Uh, it definitely takes over your life, but it's not something that you need to inherit a huge farm or, or buy acreage in order to do. After a few years, I did save up and buy my own urban seed farm, which is very exciting. It is right in the heart of Peterborough, Noguchi Jawang in Ontario, which is about an hour and a half north of Toronto, for those of you not familiar with Ontario. So this was very exciting. I was able to plow up what was a lot. Um, the tractor moved in before I even did. Uh, and so I was very happy to be able to have a space of my own. But from working with others all along the way, I, I continue to value partnering with people and borrowing other spaces of land as well. So this is the urban seed farm in a bit more of its full August glory. Uh, and a few more pictures because who can resist sharing more and more pictures um, a mm -hmm. few years ago my neighbors decided to build a giant addition on the southeast corner of the lot which needless to say was quite upsetting to me and shaded mm -hmm. out my new greenhouse so there are some challenges with urban farming for sure but still lots of benefit uh, just a few more pictures of me collecting seeds here that's a brassica, it looks like. Wasn't yes, it? so that is a kale that uh, came to bloom in a community garden plot that I had a few years ago, which was great because, you know, not too many people are, are saving seeds. And so you sort of are able to collect a, a huge um, amount of kale seed and also maybe let some others know what might happen if they, if they were to go ahead and do that as well. So any seed saver knows you can get a mountain of kale seeds from one plant. So, so very <laughs> prolific without needing very much space. Well, and that's, that's, that's one of the things you can get a mountain of seeds off of carrots, off of lettuce, off of pretty much anything you decide to save seeds from. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the great things about not needing a ton of space for this type of farming because uh, abundance is certainly inherent in, in seed saving. As I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the advantages that might come with, with growing seeds in an urban environment. So not only are our land prices incredibly expensive and might be a deterrent to people, um, but there are lots of advantages that can come. Uh, and as I said, the importance of, of growing a diversity of seeds in a diversity of, of environments. So most of the people that I know that are growing food are doing it within the city. So when people purchase seeds from me, I feel confident that they have grown in an environment that is similar to they will be gardening in. So if it grows well in my backyard, I have faith that it'll, it'll grow in others as with community gardens and other small spaces. So we know that part of a great part of seed saving is adaptation. And so having those seeds adapt to the specific climate and environment geography of urban spaces will help some of those other community gardens, rooftop gardens, backyard gardens, container gardens continue to thrive along the way. So seeds grown in urban environments will thrive in urban gardens. And that is an incredibly important thing, especially as we see lots and lots of new gardeners deciding this is a, a journey they want to embark on. You want to give them seeds you're confident will, will grow. 
Well, this is my garden in Canada. Obviously, we're dealing with some many months of really cold weather partnered with many months of a beautiful prolific, prolific weather. So it's nice for us to be able to provide seeds we know will we'll grow with those adaptations. The main things that we talk about with seed saving are this idea of isolation distances and population sizes. So two very important concepts when it comes to seed saving. But I'm going to talk about these two concepts in relation to the benefits of urban seed saving and, and how we can use these concepts as, as part of seeing the value of growing in the city. So when it comes to isolation distances, urban environment can actually provide a lot of inherent isolation, which can be very valuable. So this is a picture of an urban seed saving garden where we concentrated on growing grains. It was on a rooftop downtown in the city in which I live. Um, and so we were able to grow quite a few things that we had no concerns about crossing. This is beneficial in a couple ways. Squash, for example, I knew there was no other squash going around, so I was able to grow a rare variety up there in which we knew wouldn't mix up with, with other squash growing in the region. But we're also able to grow some grains that may mix with common weed. Here in Ontario, lamb's quarter is an incredibly common weed and it will cross with quinoa which can be really difficult if you're trying to grow quinoa out in a farm and the most common weed is going to mix up with it. Right. Uh, so growing on a rooftop here, we weren't worried about that. If there was lamb's quarters, we could e easily pull it, but felt pretty confident that we could sort of create this isolation. This is the Ministry of Natural Resources building downtown. And as you can imagine, they were quite interested into what I was growing. And so it was an, a, a great educational component to be able to talk to people. Oh, I didn't know you could grow quinoa. I didn't know you could grow it anywhere, never mind on a rooftop in the city. So not only were we able to grow this great food in isolation, but it was a great educational component to talk to people as well. Other things such as corn, um, you may find would cross with some GMO variety. So here in Ontario, we have soy and corn growing everywhere. Most of it are varieties I would not want mixing up with my corn seed bank. So this is some beautiful glass gem corn I was gifted through the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Growing in urban environments can prevent some of that, that crossing with, with GMOs. So this isolation is beneficial for a number of reasons. Uh, wild plants, GMOs, as well as other crops that it may cross with. Of course, in a community garden, you may have to worry more about isolation and some of that intermixing, but I did want to just speak about the many benefits that come with, with that isolation. And then the second component is this idea of population size. So we know as seed savers, we like to grow a large number of each crop in order to make sure we have strong genetics mixing in. And of course, that can be challenging to do in urban environments. But I would argue that on the flip side, when it comes to population size, growing seeds with other people makes for stronger seeds and stronger communities. And that I'm lucky enough to work for a not-for-profit called Nourish, in which I can integrate a lot of this work. And we really saw a value in not only just establishing a seed library, but a collective of people that were interested in growing and saving seeds and sharing resources along the way. So we found, like many of you might have, that we had a bit of trouble getting people to check back in seeds. They weren't always saving them. There were a few challenges. So we decided more to work with individual growers, be it farmers, community gardeners, anyone that wanted to learn how to save seeds and partner them with the crops they were interested in growing, as well as the knowledge and some of the resources in hopes that they would grow a larger quantity and we would have more to share at the end of the season. So it still acts as a bit of a seed library, but we don't necessarily just distribute seed on mass in the spring for, for growing. So we decided, as I said, to start sourcing really great seeds, seeds as well as seed saving knowledge and work with a little bit of a collective. So you can see I have my seed saver teacher training certificate from the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Nice. <laughs> a, a pivotal moment in my life for sure. So part of what we had done is form the Seed Savers Collective, and, and this morphs and changes from season to season, but we work with small organic market gardeners, community gardeners, home gardeners, anyone that is interested in, in sharing skills or learning um, and working together to increase the quality and quantity of locally grown seeds available in our community. 
And again, a lot of these are done in, in urban environments or small market farms in order to make sure that these seeds are adapted and, and viable in the spaces in which people will be growing them. Uh, so these are uh, some grain trials that we did with a, a local farmer who was interested in, in participating in this. Um, and a lot of what we do is try to put seed saving where people can see it. So in many of the community gardens around town, we have these urban seed saving plots where we grow a diversity of seeds to not only show people that you can grow cool things like quinoa or barley on a small scale, but also to talk a little bit about where the heck seeds come from. You know, many people might not even acknowledge that they can save bean seeds, never mind trying to identify where you find a lettuce seed. So by doing some of this, it really helps people start to see, oh, that is where my seeds come from. It's a space for us to do workshops. It's an educational opportunity. And it's just a chance to engage people in conversation around seed saving. Some of you may have heard me say this before, that there have been times where I'll be standing in the seed saving garden and someone will be chatting with me and they'll reach over, pop the head off my lettuce and say, oh, your lettuce was bolting. No. <laughs> or, oh, I weeded your lamb's quarters. Like, that was my quinoa. So I've learned over the years, signage is critical, not only oh, yes. for the educational, but to yeah. prevent things like that from happening. <laughs> That's the piece of education that we need to be doing. It's just educating people, you know, before you pull a plant out, know exactly what it is and what <laughs> part of the life cycle it's in. Oh my gosh, we have to do that. Exactly. So this is a picture of me with a rather uh, large bouquet of lettuce seed that was harvested, as you can see, at a, a pretty urban community garden. Um, so this was a great opportunity in a workshop, again, to show people what lettuce looks like when it's going to seed, and also the sheer abundance that can come with a small space. So oh that's a mountain of lettuce seed there. And if people are just doing this for themselves, that's more than enough for them, their friends, their neighbor plot holder. So just demonstrating you don't need a big amount of space in order to be harvesting these seeds. And, you know, also pollinators coming to these seeds as they come to flower has its own opportunity as well, as many people don't often let things like lettuce or brassicas go to seed. And we grow a ton of amaranth, big conversation piece, just getting people engaged in the idea of seed saving, what it is and how they might be able to go about doing it. We work together, as I said, with a bunch of people. We try to share knowledge and work at building a resilient regional seed system. We are lucky to have a diversity of community members who have told us things like it's hard to find okra seed. I would really love to be able to grow some. So we want to work with farmers and gardeners where they're at and identify things they might have trouble sourcing that are specific to an environment. We had one market gardener who grows a lot of early greens in their greenhouse. And so they wanted to save seeds from that because that's a specific adaptation. So we're open to ideas of what works for, for people and working with them. Some more pictures of, of some of our gardens here. Kids really love engaging kids in, in bean seed saving. They love it. You know, these are orca beans. These kids were mad at me for half a day when they realized that whales did not sprout from, from the seeds that we planted, uh, but they quickly got engaged in the idea of seed saving and, and those colorful beans are just so fun for them to, to enjoy. And we have many kids participating in, in our bean seed saving projects across the, the city. And nice. getting everybody engaged, getting people to just touch the seeds, watch it. We're not necessarily worried about getting the largest harvest we can. We're more engaged in getting people to participate in the process. For the last many years, we have welcomed several Syrian families to Peterborough through a, a government sponsorship program, uh, and many of them identified it was difficult for them to find some seeds they were used to growing. One crop they really enjoyed was malokia, and I was finally able to find the seed through True Love Seeds, and so we were able to work with them in growing some malokia. They were very happy to be able to find the seed and, and were happy to offer up some, some knowledge about um, how to go about saving those seeds and growing that food as well. Malokia is it's an herb. It's a green, almost grows like basil. It gets quite tall and bushy. And it, you actually make a dish called malokia, which is um, just a very sort of cooked down green. 
So many of these families identified as it being critical to their diet, um, but had trouble accessing the seeds. So another thing that we do is share equipment. So, you know, many people are living in apartments or small spaces. We like to say, you know, we don't need a drill. We just need a hole in the wall. So not everybody needs a seed cleaner. Uh, we can do communal seed saving or seed cleaning workshops. Having an aspirator is unending conversation. People want to know what that is, how it works, want to take part in it. And then you get people to help you clean your seeds along the way. So doing hands-on workshops, getting people to really experience how to do it. And uh, this seed cleaning machine is a bit of quality control as well. So it helps make sure we have good quality seeds to distribute to people. Thank you, Jillian, for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about how people can get seeds from Urban Tomato. Uh, so you can go on your website, um, on my website, urbantomato.ca. I'm not really supposed to be shipping to, to the state, so that, that could cause a problem, but I'm super happy to chat with people about setting up urban seed saving projects and, and all the work we do and, and how we can end up working together across our border that separates us. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I hope we can meet again in person someday soon. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for that, Jillian. Um, there were a bunch of questions for Jillian. We're going to have to forward those over to her um, to get them answered because I don't know things like what the B action is like, although. You know, what I've noticed in my front yard is that when uh, there's a lot of things flowering, like right now I have carrots and celery and cilantro uh, and oregano that are all flowering right now. So um, the, the, the bee and bug action for pollinators are, are great there. Are you out there, Bill? I am. All righty. Bell just told me one minute ago, you went outside for a walk and it's like, go oh, get him up here. <laughs> so yeah, um, we are talking, Bill is talking about introduction to the issues of seed patenting. And <clears throat> this is something that's really gotten loud most recently. Uh, when I say recently in like last three or four years, I think. Um, so we're going to touch on that. Bill is the uh, co-founder of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and previous executive director. Bill and his wife, Belle, co-founded Seed School in 2010 and Seed School Online, I think in 2013. We do, uh, we do Seed School Online periodically at uh, Urban Farm U. Uh, currently, Bill is heading up the patent-free seed campaign, teaching and handling IT for the organization. You'll have to tell us about that here. And oh, I guess you're going to tell us about it now. Cool. Because I didn't know that. Bill wrote this basic seed saving in 1994, and it is still the go to book for seed saving. And we have a copy of it right here. In fact, it's a, uh, we uh, include it in your, um, in your seed bundles when you buy them. I think it's one of the, in one of the bundles it's included. So that's it. It's a teeny little book, but it is jam packed with great information. So, um, Mr. McDormand, are you ready to go? I am. Does that right. look, th my screen's up and it looks good. Yeah, it looks great. All right. You bet. Well, I just thought I'd start with a little bit of context. Why, if we're teaching people how to save seeds, are we gonna get caught up in something that could be uh, deemed political, a campaign? And the reason is it, uh, there is a movement afloat that stops seed saving. It actually brings legal force to keep people from saving their own seeds. And it's largely happening without people knowing about it. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today. Um, and I'm doing so because for me, seed savings very important because it helps us create and keep diversity in our communities. And we've never needed that diversity more. I think the United Nations um, did a study in 1999 and showed that about 90% of the crop varieties have disappeared from farmers' fields. This is larger than that, I think, from um, uh, uh, in our home gardens. 
we just don't grow as many different kinds of things. And with climate change and all the changes that we're facing, we've never needed diversity more. And so anything that keeps us from being able to save our own seeds and therefore create and keep diversity in our gardens is a threat to us. And so that's largely explains why we have the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. We're just a network of seed savers. Um, you can go on our website, RockyMountainSeeds.org. You can find these kinds of directories for seed savers and seed teachers and seed libraries and small seed companies. And you can click on the little icons and pull up the information to connect with those people yourselves. All of those on the screen are seed stewards. These are people that have agreed by filling out a form on our website to at least grow, save, and share one thing. Okay, and so we don't want anything that keeps us from being able to do that, but it's starting to happen. So if you, if you want a, an entry point, or this was my entry point, is go to your local farmer's market. Uh, Bell and I, as we were helping to start the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance six years ago now, went to farmer's markets all over the Rocky Mountain West. And at those markets, we um, uncovered something. It wasn't shocking, but um, I was amazed at how concentrated it was. Ask those farmers that are actually selling, growing and selling food at your market where they get their seeds. I challenge everybody to do this. And what you'll find is that what, what we found is that there are three overwhelming answers. Number one answer, and almost every farmer answered at least uh, uh, got some of their seeds from Johnny's Selected Seeds in Albany, Maine. Johnny's has become a $60 million company um, supplying seeds to market farmers and to the restaurant trade and this sort of new small scale, mid-sized industrial organic agriculture. The other two companies were High Mowing Seeds, which is also um, in the Northeast, it's in Vermont, and um, Territorial Seeds, which is sort of the equivalent on the West Coast um, in Oregon. And uh, Shock Up Shocks, uh, these largest organic seed providers in the United States are now selling certified organic patented seeds. These are seeds that restrict you from saving the seeds. And I've found oftentimes the uh, designation that they're patented is uh, either non-existent, hard to find, or actually just mistaken. It's just not there. And so that's why I'm giving this lecture. If you want to be concerned about seed saving as a nation as we go forward and we want as much diversity as we can, we should probably pay attention to this. So, and there's, I, I guess, you know, COVID brought a whole nother worry about uh, us all getting our seeds from one source. Um, this is from the Johnny Selected Seed um, Catalog a website. This was the homepage when I went there this spring. Uh, basically said, we're not filling orders for home gardeners right now that because of the pressure put on COVID and the disruption in supply chains or whatever. And there are rumors now that uh, a large percentage of uh, Johnny seeds are actually being contract grown in Maine or in China now. And that may explain some of this delay, I don't know. But anyway, you know, what happens if you're expect if you're a home gardener, you're a great home gardener and you wanna get your seeds every year and you're in a pretty short season and you, you get on to order them and you can't order them. All right. So our answer to that is that you save your own. Um, this kind of just gives you a quick peek into how big this organic seed market is getting now. In the next four years, it's expected to uh, almost be four times the size it is today. And there's some statistics there for you. Also, um, this idea about patented seed is just not being talked about. It's just sort of quietly sliding in underneath. And, and getting more and more um, prevalent in these seed catalogs. And this is the Organic Seed Alliance, which is the largest um, organization of organic seed growers in the United States. And you could, till recently, this is now down, um, you could go to the resources page, you could find organic seed producers directory, you could find out where to get organic seeds. One click could get you to, uh, you could search for lettuces or whatever you wanted. Uh, two clicks actually could get you to this point where you could actually buy Selenet, a raw organic seed. Um, and uh, Selenet is patented. And there's nowhere on this page that tells you that. There's nowhere in this whole process that would tell you that you're buying seed that for the first time uh, you cannot save. So what does that mean? Um, 
we generally describe the patenting that's going on with uh, uh, the kind that we are against as utility patents. And what, what does that mean? Utility patents are just regular patents. It's the same patent you would get on a new microchip or a new piece of software, all right? And so Johnny's definition is it applies to seeds or seeds that can only be used for crop production. They cannot be used for seed saving, replanting, resale, giving away, or use in any breeding program. And this is unprecedented in our country's history. In fact, if you go, it goes back to the Magna Carta. Farmers have always been able to grow and save their own seeds. And this ends this practice. It, this largely came about not through legislation in the United States, but through a Supreme Court ruling. And we talk about those in our seed schools if you want to dig deeper. The most important thing then is if we're not going to stop this, and this is where private enterprise is going with our seeds, then at least get us a list of all the patented varieties so that we can find out what's going on. So that we can tell our seed libraries and tell each other to stay away from them at this point, because right now it's it's rather hard to find out. And when I um, uh, email Johnny's every year, and I've done this for four years, this is basically the answer that I get back. No master list. They're not willing to tell us. And as I said, even some of the varieties in their own catalog are mismarked. They are getting better and marking them, but it's still really hard to say. What they do tell you is to go to the United States P Trade and Patent Office and to search for them. They said, you can get a list, just go there and search. And so I tried to do that. And when I did, I was rather shocked to find that um, 78 out of the 99 lettuce varieties in the Johnny Selected Seed Catalog are not traceable in US government um, databases. And the reason for this is that there are traits inside of varieties that are being patented that restrict them and not the variety name itself. So you, we don't know what those traits are, what their numbers are. And so if we're going looking for patented stuff, we can't find it because it doesn't, in those databases, searching for variety names does not reveal anything. And so this is the result of my 2021 search. I've been doing this for several years. Uh, four years ago, when I first started, about 28% of the varieties of lettuce, I just picked one crop, um, open pollinated, easy to save crop that we can now no longer save because some of the varieties are patented. And I was shocked to find out that 57% of the varieties now are protected either through PVP which is the Plant Variety Protection Act. And I'm not gonna explain that for the, because of the shortness of this lecture, but just uh, let it be said that you're not supposed to save those seeds either. And um, 46 out of the 99 lettuces in the Johnny's catalog carry utility patents. That's 46.5% of the varieties are now patented. That's up from 28% just a few years ago. Where's that gonna go? I mean, there are people at the United Nations tell me the goal is to have them 100% patented. This is, and again, this is one of the easiest crops to save. This is the one we teach in our basic seed saving courses. It's where you should start saving seed. And now we're no longer able to save it. Um, and only 21 of the 99, as I said before, are searchable. So here's what you would find if you go into the Johnny's catalog. This is from a couple of years ago. They don't even have this kind of detail in there anymore. But uh, in Sal... Salanova, which is one of the most popular lettuces now. Now, down at the bottom, they would give you the patent numbers the, of the traits that were being patented, but you could never find Salanova on the website as, as, as being patented on the US uh, Patent and Trade Office database. It does not say Salanova. And we know why. It's because those traits underneath are the ones that are patented. Some of them are. This is another Johnny's where this variety of lettuce, you can see it's underlying utility patent granted. Now notice this is not set aside. This is not highlighted. This is the most important change in descriptions in Johnny's catalog in its history, I think. And I've been, I remember catalog number one and they sort of hide it in the description. I put the red line under it. If you go to high mowing, um, here's an example of an open pollinated pepper that is uh, protected using PVP doesn't really explain what that means. It's next to TMV, which is disease resistance. This is how these things are starting to creep into our catalogs. And if you go to territorial, here's a variety of lettuce that is utility patented. I verified that through other means, no mention. There's no mention of patents at all in the territorial catalog. So 
what does this mean? Is somebody going to come get you if you save your own seed from a, a, a patented variety? Well, you know, we, one could argue that a grassroots movement of seed savers is not going to be worth it to them. And you, you hear sort of these winks and nods that, oh, Bill, the companies doing organic seed patents don't really want to do it. They just have to do it because other big companies are doing it. And that's just what they have to do as a corporation these days. But um, on one of the sites when I was reading up, it had a reference to a place called AIB, and I'd never heard of that, so I went to their website, and it turns out this is the Anti-Infringement Bureau. This is an international trade organization, and as you look, uh, these are some of the seed companies that are part of this, and Enzazaden, which is Vitalis, which supplies most of the organic varieties to Johnny's that are patented, is a member of this organization. So what does this mean? Well, if you dig a little deeper, you can find language like this on the website. The production use and trading of illegal products is as important, is an important source for the financing of organized crime. Saving your seeds as organized crime. Wow, that's a whole, I'm just gonna take me a while to get used to that. And now there's a US version of this called SIPA, the Seed Improvement and Protection Alliance. And so there's hotline numbers for people to call and turn you in. This is how serious they are. In fact, they go even farther and define innovation to mean privatization that we have to patent if there's going to be any innovation in this industry. And as I sit here, I go 10,000 years of people growing and saving their own seeds. They didn't even know about Mendel. They created all that we eat out of um, basically inedible plants. I mean, prickly lettuce that grows in your, your uh, alley is hardly edible. And now we have beautiful lettuce because somebody a long time ago grew and saved the varieties that weren't bitter. And now we're coming along and say there's going to be no innovation unless we can patent these things. It just, I can't understand it. So Europe's actually ahead of us. They've awakened a bit. They've got a movement called No Patents on Seeds, 80 organizations. Right now, this is being challenged constantly by the multi our multinational corporations. But right now in Europe, you cannot place a utility patent on a variety if it has been derived by biological processes, the way we always have done it, growing and saving our own seeds. The only things you can utility patent that are plants are genetically modified. They're saying, yeah, those are new inventions. You change the genetic structure of those plants, you can have that. And so, and for me, that would be enough. Just leave us alone. And don't bring your patenting into our era and keep us from saving our own seeds so that we can meet the challenges of climate change by producing our own diversity in our own backyard. And so I always like to end with something that Joy Houch, she's a former director of Native Seed Search said. Remember this, every time you get your seeds, no matter where they come from, when choosing a cultivar, you're choosing an entire agricultural system. If you are choosing patented seeds, you are supporting this incredible monopolization, industrialization, and now criminalization of our agricultural system. So you can join our patent-free seed campaign um, at RockyMountainSeeds.org, and we'll just keep you up to date as we learn more and we learn to interface more with the people in Europe. So thank you. Wow. So we're actually going to come back to questions after we talk about the Great American Seed up on that. But um, let's see here. Where was it? Latasha says, wow, how articulately capitalist. We should pay attention to this. I'm going to spread the word to my fellow urban gardeners. It's, it's, it's mind boggling, Bill, this, this, it's just mind boggling. And, and it, you know, with no way to track it, are they going to come up with machines that that can scan a seed and know the genetics of it? <laughs> well, you know, it, it seems mind boggling to us, but, you know, hundreds of millions of gardener, of farmers and gardeners around the world have been facing this sort of thing. There are draconian laws being um, introduced and enforced in Africa and in what we call the global south, the smaller, you know, countries. Wow that have had to face up against 
Monsanto, which is now Bayer and these other companies and they're, you know, onward march to privatize all of this. And so for it to finally come home and hit us, it is mind boggling, but it's time for us to wake up because it's our responsibility worldwide to protect this diversity and it's being eroded most overseas, but now it's gonna start, you know, intimidating us in our own backyards. Right. Wow. That's, yeah. Thank you for that. That's great. You're welcome. Um, so we're going to actually show a Great American Seed Up video. It's about three minutes. That's next. And then we're going to talk about Seed Up in a Box. Then we're going to do some Q&A. And then we're going to get on with uh, Rich Murphy. So go ahead and run that video. Welcome to the Great American Seed Up. My name is Greg Peterson with... Bell Star. The Great American Seed Up was created by Bell Star. Bill McDormand, Kari Spencer, and myself in 2015. Normally we do it this time of year in a room twice this size. This room goes way farther along. And it's a seed saving event, a seed education event, where you can come in and scoop amazing seeds for an amazing price. The cost of seeds mostly is in the distribution system and the packaging itself. So we're taking care of that for you. Our goal with the Great American Seed Up is to get as many seeds into the hands of as many people as possible throughout the state when we started the Great American Seed Up and now throughout the country and the world because we want people to save seeds and be uh, connected to the magic of what this can do to help create a regional, local food system with seeds as the foundation. So because of COVID, we had to pivot and we created what we called Seed Up in a Box. And you have an opportunity to take advantage of three different bundles. And these are the seeds that we sourced, got a pipeline in through one of our founders, Bill McDormand, who's been doing this work for 40 years. So he's got great sources for seeds, and we've chosen the seeds that are the most popular and the easiest to grow. What you're seeing here on the table is our essential bundle. This is 25 varieties of seeds times 10 packets. And your job, once you get this, is to split it into single packets. So we give you all that you need, instructions, all the packaging, all the seeds to be able to make up 10 bundles for your friends and family. This is about the size of a packet of seeds from maybe a regular seed company, okay? This is the size of a packet of seeds that you would get at the physical Great American Seed Up. This is seed up in a box. This is 10 portions. The math comes out to about 60, 60 cents, cents a, packet. a packet. 60 cents a packet for seeds. This is amazing. And these are jumbo packets of seeds. In the essential bundle, you're gonna get herbs, you're gonna get lettuce, you're gonna get peppers, tomatoes, beets, Swiss chard, squash, lettuce, cucumbers. Cilantro. Cilantro, <laughs> all kinds of amazing seeds. 25 different open pollinated, non-GMO varieties for planting and growing out in your yard. There are no other opportunities like this out there. This is, this is really a unique opportunity and, and we've done all the work for you in terms of the variety and the education and the program and how to organize it all. So the reason that you should buy Seed Up in a Box is to invigorate your local community seed economy. Because with local seeds, you have local food. And this is a screaming deal. Plus, it comes with education. So go to greatamericanseedup.org, check out the website, check out our other videos, and buy your seed bundle. So this whole seed thing with me started back in 2011. And uh, I asked Bill, I said, how do, we, how do we activate our local seed economy? And through a course of many conversations and three different projects that we did together and bringing in Bell and bringing in Janice and bringing in Kari, um, we, we got to a place about six years ago where we were doing the Great American Seed Up in person. Then with COVID, what happened? Well, we all know what happened. And so we created our seed up in a box. And I've got Bell and Janice, they're gonna jump on. 
but just to give you a sense, this is one of our bundles. This is one of our bundles. I don't know which one it is. I just know it's one of our big bundles and you know, it's about a hundred and, uh oh, Janice, we're not hearing you. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, it's one of our little bundles. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. there you go. That's one of our little bundles. There you go. So, uh, Belle, why don't you jump in and tell us how you, because this is the seat up in a box you brought to the team and said, oh my gosh, let's do this. So tell us about that. Uh, was it another hot tub moment? <laughs> it was. <laughs> we have all our great ideas it in the was. hot tub. Um, you know, it just made sense. I mean, everything was was transferring to online and it just seemed like the log logical thing for us to do because we didn't want to stop being of service to our greater community. So then it was a question of how do we take all these different, what at times felt like maybe disparate pieces and put them all together so that we had something that was cohesive that people could take advantage of um, in terms of jumpstarting their own uh, areas to get everybody on board with seed saving, have enough seeds and enough education. I mean, I've seen several questions. How do I save seeds? What do I need to do? How do I start? This is what we do. Getting Certainly getting a bundle will, will help you, um, you know, move into that a little bit more easily. And then all of the education that we have through the Great American Seed Up Urban Farm, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, the Micro Farm Project. There's so many resources and we wanna help tie all those together. So yeah, so yeah I, I'm pretty impressed. We packaged up seeds last week and it, it was just, really? Is, is this, Bill, check this please. It seems like it's wrong. There's too many in this bag. Well, so, so. so interestingly, in the video, you uh, pulled out Swiss chard. Yes. Bill. And um, I happen to, in this bundle that I have here, I happen to have a bag of Swiss chard. This has got to be, I'm going to say it's easily 12 to 16 ounces. So almost a pound of Swiss chard seeds. This is a 10 pack from the Great American Seed Up. For your seed yeah. up in a box. Yeah. And your job is to split it. So you take the really cool thing, and thank you, Janice. The really cool thing that we did is we put together a business card that talks about the, the seed and what to do with it. So your job is to take this packet and we have an instruction card in here on the size of scoop and you divide it by 10 and we send you the, the Ziploc bags to do that with as well. So you get everything to do your own Great American Seed Up. Right, Janice? Yeah, you get to do your own little community sharing event and you can even do this as a gift exchange you can do this as a church uh, promotion where you're trying to increase the self-sufficiency in your church get a couple of bundles um, you can mix and match different varieties that you want it's all going to be a sharing a community a mutualism type event so just so people know this is not like you know we just is a random guess of how many seeds we can put in there in these bags you know this comes from bill's extensive knowledge in the seed business he's been in, he had seed companies over the years and he's been involved in seeds since the early 80s and so this is based on you know what would a really good deal look like especially if we're not physically packaging them up like we said in that yeah. video is that that's the cost you know it's that whole chain of events that has to happen for us to package up one packet at a time so there's well, real the logic in this yeah the interesting thing is is that if you go to the store and you buy a packet of basil and i've done this recently just to see what's in it and i open the packet of basil and i look down in it and there's like 28 seeds down in the bottom. That's a packet of seeds that you pay $2.99, $3.99 for. Our seed scoop size at the Great American Seed Up for basil is how big, Janice? Tablespoon, way to throw me off and make me go look. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's either, a, it's, it's either a teaspoon or a tablespoon, but it's a gram. That's I think where we went was with, with basil, it's a gram. And at the Great American Seed Up, the grant that scoop size is 75 cents. Now, remember the packet of seeds with 28 or 32 seeds in it at the store? A gram of basil seeds has how many seeds in it? Belle or Janice, you want to take a guess? Actually, no. No. I know I'm going to get it wrong. 600. 
So in a Great American Seed Up, Seed Up in a Box bundle, the scoop is a gram. You're going to get 600 seeds in a, once you boil it down to your package. So, and I'll tell you what, how much fun, Bell, is it packaging seeds? <laughs> it's magical. It really is. It's, it's meditation. That's what it is. It's just this, yeah. it's this um, seed packaging meditation. It's a great way to connect. You get to see all the seeds. You get to touch them. You get to smell them. Yeah, it's it's yeah. meditation. Oh, it is. you you had you had one of our friends helping us scoop last weekend, and she was commenting. Diana, Diana. she was commenting on the smell, and oh. so I've actually been storing seeds here at the urban farm since we started this seven years ago. And the seeds have a very dis look at my eyes. I'm going a little crazy because of the smell. The smell of seeds is amazing. It's life. I love the smell of seeds. It's new life. What a crazy, yeah. crazy, just the energy in a box of seeds when you open it up is amazing. We are getting great feedback from those who have ordered seed up in a box before. And for those of us who are sitting in the room bundling these seeds up and packaging them up, we just, it's so energizing. I love it. So, so can I can I reference just something that came up on the um, chat? Please, question? absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> the yeah. question is, will they work in Canada? I believe we are shipping to Canada, but yes. more yes. importantly, remember when we talked about land race seeds. So the value in these long-standing heirloom seeds that have been around for a very long time that we encourage people to start with to start their seed saving adventure. So a lot of what we have would be considered land race seeds. As mm -hmm. much as we sort of disparage or um, dispute with a one size all kind of approach to, to using seeds, we are going to give you stuff that has a long standing reputation and, and, and resilience and, and are really robust. So you can take them and and work with them where you are. If you grow green peppers where you are, you can grow these land race green peppers. If you can grow tomatoes, you, we had another question of someone wanting to know, well, can I take oranges to Michigan and make land races out of them? If they don't grow oranges in Michigan, then you can't grow oranges in Michigan. Same thing with these vegetable seeds and grains, wildflowers, herbs, etc. Part and the, the trick the to growing in Canada versus growing in Phoenix is being aware of the soil temperatures. You're not going to start your tomatoes in Phoenix the same time you're going to start your tomatoes in Canada, unless maybe you might have a greenhouse. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. So I got to okay. go ahead, Bill. No, Karen just wrote that uh, package of yeah. uh, Johnny's basil is uh, there's 200 seeds though, 495. So there. Yep. Okay. Yep, there you go. There you go. And for basically 60 cents, you get uh, 600 seeds in, uh, in our packets. So and thanks you know, for calling that out. Go ahead, Janice. There are some seeds out there that are really, really expensive. And yeah. um, what we have done is we've gathered a few of those to add into our bundle. And you know, obviously our packages are gonna be a lot smaller just to make them affordable, but they're still larger than what you would get if you bought a package at the, um, at the hardware store or wherever. Hey Janice, tell us about the bundles, would you? Well, we have several different bundles we, um, and you can select from them online at the um, or at greatamericanseedup.org or .com, they both work. And they what you work. have is the essential bundle, the basic bundle, the um, uh, banquet bundle, all of those have 25 different seeds in them that are going to be in the 10 portion packs. And then we have an ultimate bundle, which has 75 different seeds in them. And they're kind of uh, broken up a little bit by price range. So we can put a little bit more expensive seeds in the, in the uh, banquet bundle than we do in the basic, but there's still great places to get started. Then after you've selected the bundle that you want to start with, you can add on by using a mix and match bundle, or you can start with a mix and match bundle and just meet our minimum of uh, purchasing amount requirement. And then don't forget, you can throw on extra basic seed saving books. Each oh, bundle yes. starts with one, although the ultimate has five. Oh, and, there you go. and you can even pick up Kari's city farming book if you want to do that. And these are fabulous gifts any time of the year. Any May time day, of the year. May Day, May Day. Somebody went onto the Gasu site, uh, Great American Seed Up, and they said that the essential 25 varieties show insufficient stock. <gasps> 
Is that I will go uh -oh. fix that. <laughs> we can fix that. Janice can go fix that. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I do want to address one question here real quick. Bev and Aaron, uh, is there a way to keep the seeds viable over a few years? I have just a small urban garden. Yes. First of all, buy a bundle and share it with your friends and family and neighbors and community gardens. But secondly, so in our seed school online, seedschoolonline.com, if you go there, you can actually jump in and learn all about seed saving. But we talk about storing seeds long term and it's really simple. It's the mantra is cool, dark, and dry. And so you want to keep your seeds cool, dark, and dry. And honestly, the best place to store them long-term is in a jar with a solid lid on it in your freezer. So what I would, what I do for long-term seed storage is I take my seed packets like this and they go into a gallon jar and they go into the freezer. And I actually have two sets. I have my cool season crops and my warm season crops in two different jars. And then when you pull them out of the freezer, um, let them come to full room temperature. So pull them out of the freezer, let them sit for 24 hours and then open the jar. That way they're not sucking in all the uh, moisture from the outside. So thank you for asking that question. Um, and I take it, Janice, you're uh, fixing the I am on it right now. I'm getting my list of inventory so I can update some things. Um, apparently Excellent. somebody said another bundle was uh, showing insufficient. Just check them all. I, well, yeah, I got to go in there. We just did all this bagging this weekend and I need to update a few things. So I'm right, going to cool. step off and go take care of that. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Bell. Any, any last thoughts, Bell, before we jump into- uh, I'm, I'm trying to answer uh, some Murphy. of the questions. Um, uh, answer some of the questions that are coming in that I that you know could just get a quick answer. Um, some of them we've we've touched on, so keep those coming in. I guess after Rich, we'll do a little Q and A thing and try to path do another yep. pass at these. Yep, okay. we got Rich and then no, it was a great job. We got Rich and then we got Bill talking about wild seeds, and then we'll do more My Q and A. Awesome. Um, so hey, uh, let it rock. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Bell. Thank you. Um, all right, Rich Murphy, what an interesting guy. I had so much fun doing this interview with him. Rich Murphy is the executive director of Veterans to Farmers, a nonprofit organization focused on helping veterans transition from the battlefields to the field of dreams. I like that. Rich started playing with plants after his service in the military and realized how healing and transformative Gardening can be for vets attempting to return to a normal, in quotes, life. In 2015, he attended seed school and has been incorporated, incorporating seed saving and seed education into his programs since. And uh, Rich is an amazing teacher. I couldn't rave enough about him. Uh, after I got off the phone, I called Bill and just like was, whoa, this guy is good. So you're in for a treat. So we'll do that. And then we'll do seed saving uh, of wild seeds with Bill. And then we'll do more Q&A. Take it away, PW. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for being here. We're talking today about veterans and seed saving. That's awesome. Thanks, Greg. It's awesome to get the chance to hang out with you and talk a little bit about the subject. Thanks. Well, let's jump in. You bet. So um, I'll start uh, by introducing myself. My name is Richard Murphy. Uh, I'm the executive director and co-founder for Veterans to Farmers. It's a nonprofit here in Colorado uh, where we take veterans and introduce them to agriculture and agricultural practices, uh, both in the attempt to get them involved in agriculture, but also as a, a means of kind of finding a space to rejoin a veteran community alongside the farm community and, and heal a little bit in the soil. I, uh, I'm going to use this afternoon, this you know, opportunity to kind of just chit chat a little bit with everybody who's watching about not only the work that we're doing, but also maybe some reasons why you might want to save seeds uh, or as well, why it's just an incredible opportunity or uh, an opportunity for you to, to learn about something that really, I think, can actually make a huge impact in your own personal garden. So like I mentioned, I am uh, the executive director. I'm also a third generation Air Force veteran. So I, I come from a family of veterans. I own 35 acres up in Northern Colorado on a little homestead with me and my family where we grow a bunch of our own food and save a bunch of seeds. I'm a graduate of the CSU Building Farmers course. I've been playing with plants for about 20 years. I'm a certified plant nerd, love everything about them. Nice. Uh, and, 
an absolute proud Rocky Mountain Ski School instructor graduate. So that's just a little bit about, about me uh, and my kind of background. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to spend more time kind of telling you about, you know, what it is we do. So I'll start with a few veteran facts. I think it's easy uh, with what we see in the news and in media sometimes to get some confusion around what veterans are experiencing and, you know, what that looks like. And a lot of times we only hear the downside. And unfortunately, there are downsides. Um, the veteran suicide rate is pretty high amongst veterans. You know, and there are, is some problems, I think, with a few percentage of veterans that are transitioning back into the civilian world. But what's important to remember, with 60% of our U.S. adult population being in a veteran and at some point in time serving in the military, the majority of them are doing just fine. It's actually 45% more likely for veterans to be self-employed or start a business or be an entrepreneur. Studies have actually shown veterans have volunteer on average more than 160 hours annually. That's 25% more than their civilian counterparts. And what this does is this tells us that when a veteran is healthy and they're doing well, not only are they a member of our community, but they're an incredible productive member of our community. And so at Veterans to Farmers, we recognize that in agriculture, there needed to be, you know, we've heard that statistic, you know, the veterans or the farmers are getting older. We, we knew that there needs to be more people moving into agriculture. And we kind of identified veterans as a population that could be incredible at that. They have some of those natural skill sets from the military, like attention to detail, and they understand hard work and sacrifice, all, the, all these things that, you know, you need to be a farmer, kind of weather that storm. Now, for the few that are out there that are still struggling, instead, what we decided is we wanted to create a place for them to heal. And that was really what Veterans to Farmers was formed around. It was this opportunity for veterans to come out on the farm, hang out with other veterans, uh, and learn about this process. Uh, anybody, and I'm assuming if you're watching this, has realized that if you spend enough time in a garden, right, there's lots of lessons that we can learn from that. You know, some of those lessons, you know, are, are obvious. We, we are able to sit out there and be present with the plants. There's a, that moment of silence, that opportunity to experience nature. And so that was kind of what we wanted to create. So over the last eight years and 150 graduates later, we've taken veterans and given them the opportunity to learn as much as possible about agriculture and experience it. Some of that includes things like equine therapy. A lot of our veterans have learned that hanging out with horses is fun. And I always joke because I'm actually afraid of horses. I, I tend to skip this day. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, a lot of veterans find something in there that's amazing. Our veterans also spend the afternoon growing and, and, and or, I'm sorry, planting and harvesting and seeding and doing everything that you would do on the farm. They spend that summer as well learning how to keep bees. And we have a, we have a beekeeper on site who shows them how that process works. They get to experience different types of agriculture like aquaponics and hydroponics. We tour different farms. We spend a lot of time talking about soil and what goes on in there, soil science and all those microbes. And that picture that you see there on the left is actually a field that one of our graduates this year, he actually planted eight acres of winter wheat in it, actually planted it in the fall. We go to different greenhouses, whether they're passive greenhouses, we go to big greenhouses. And on the left there, one of my favorite things to show people is that that guy is actually a hardened, battled Marine and he loves flowers <laughs> nice. together you know nice. so it's a really cool opportunity for them to experience i think agriculture and themselves in a different light you know again like i said we've had 150 graduates some of them have gone on to do amazing things uh, go back to school we have yak farmers mushroom farmers market farmers people doing uh, value-added products things like that and it's just this kind of really cool opportunity i think for the veterans to just see how many different ways you can be involved in agriculture right because there's so many different things you could do and we do spend a lot of time, I think, focusing on, you know, what it means to be a veteran and what that looks like coming back into, you know, the civilian community and maybe some of those troubles that you have with adapting and learning how to kind of work together with that. It's my opinion that veterans really want to be a part of their community. And if we give them that opportunity, they're going to thrive in that community. So that's just a little bit about what we do. Now for seed saving, I ended up in a seed school in 2016. This here is my seed family complete accident. One of our veterans wanted to go to the seed school. I had no interest. I actually thought it was kind of weird because you could just buy seeds in a magazine. So what was <laughs> <Right>. the <point? laughs> and then I went to this mountain seed school and what do you know? It was amazing. And as soon as I finished, it became apparent to me that I needed to introduce this into our curriculum. I needed to find a way to, to make sure that we were teaching seed saving in our, in our daily curriculum. And what's interesting is, you know, for a lot of people, if you're watching, I think a lot of people come to, um, you know, trying to grow food and saving seeds because we're interested in local food, right? We want to know where our food comes from. We want that self-reliancy, that sustainability. This last year, if anything, showed us, right, like, what does our food security look like and how much control do we actually have over that? You know, so I started thinking about it and I was like, well, where does local food start? And if you spend enough time in a seed school, you quickly realize it starts with seeds. It doesn't start with the, the seeds that you bought in the magazine. 
you know, th those, those are great seeds, but they may have traveled, you know, a thousand miles to reach you. And they, they almost know nothing about your environment, you know, so to really be local, and I think have that legitimate control over your food security, you know, seed saving has to be a part of your repertoire. It has to be part of your plan. You know, we think about this 50 years ago, 70% of the produce found in grocery stores was produced within a hundred miles of where you bought it from, wow. you know, and nowadays this is 1500 miles. You know, if you look at this in population, you know, 50 years ago, the population on earth was half of what it was today. So what we know is it's never going to not be important to save your seeds and know where your food comes from. This is, this is just an, an incredibly important thing. So when we ask this question, you know, where does local food start? It is with a handful of seeds. So when we, when we think about this, that handful of seeds is the most powerful technology we possess. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of years of people's hard work in that seed, adapting it, creating it. You know, there's this opportunity for us to turn one seed into 10,000 seeds. I mean, this is huge impact, something that we all used to know, but over time, unfortunately, we've just, I think, forgot what this looks like. You know, your garden is your best seed catalog. Now, I love January when the plethora of seed magazines come in and I'm up late at night with a cup of tea highlighting, dreaming about right. everything I want to grow, right? That's the best time of the year. You know it's coming. But your garden will always give you the best seed. It will give you the best seed because it's adapted to your environment year after year after year. Greg, I think I remember in one of your podcasts, you were talking about, was it basil that you have that reseeds every year there oh, in Arizona? Oh, yeah. Well, all kinds of things. But yes, right? basil for sure just tons of it. And you don't even have to do anything because right. it's doing it all on its own, right? Exactly. So that's the next point. This is so easy that the earliest humans could do it. And I mean that literally. The earliest humans were saving seeds. It's part of the reason we have the civilization we have now. And by doing that, you're going to adapt those seeds to your environment. They're going to understand what, what kind of things they're going to face, what environmental pressures they're going to be up against. And as we talk about moving forward in agriculture, and what that looks like in adapting to a constant changing climate, this is going to be key to that, you know? So what is a seed? You know, we think about it as just this little bean or this little tomato seed in a package. But if we take time to look at these things, they're beautiful, they're like little jewels, like little gifts from nature. I love, I love doing germination testing because I find, I find all the little baby seeds with their roots, the radicals hanging out. It's almost like being in a nursery. There's just something beautiful about getting to observe that process all the symmetry, you know, nature has created this art through seed work. And it's, it's just an incredible thing to experience. And I think if we take that time to experience seeds beyond just what we got in the mail in a packet and learn about them, there's so much more that's there for us to, to be taught, for us to learn, you know, about ourselves, about our ancestors. Seeds in a lot of ways, you know, with the veteran community, what I love about it is uh, I think there's this kind of ability for us to tell our stories through the seeds, you know, and, and, and it creates this, this opportunity. So, you know, when we think about seeds, where did seeds come from? Well, about 400 million years ago, they kind of started showing up. And these were, you know, not quite the, the advanced plants we think of today. That happened a little bit later, about 125 million years ago. And that's our angiosperms, right? So an angiosperm is any flowering plant, right? Any flower you've ever seen, you stared at an angiosperm. And this was a huge evolutionary advancement in, in plant life on earth at this time, because up until that point in time, it was actually a lot more laborious for plants to reproduce. Um, I always like to point out to people, you don't think about it in these ways, but that little tiny yellow tomato flower that you saw that turned into a big red tomato is an ovary and you are chewing on a delicious plant ovary. And that ovary <laughs> is there to protect the seed. Now it's a little weird to think of it that way, but that's what's happening. Yeah. Now, what's more amazing is about 12,500 years ago, that's you know, 13,000 years, humans began to actually to start saving these seeds. They started to recognize these patterns in nature and they realized that they could create some independence from the hunting and gathering kind of lifestyle and moving to this agrarian kind of, of lifestyle. And we saw this happen independently across the, the globe, right? We saw it happening in Mesopotamia. You know, we, uh, we saw it happening in, in, um, in Asia, in the Indus Valley, you know, all across. So we knew that humans were doing this collectively. And this all started with them saving their seeds. It's the most basic elemental thing, but easily the most important thing you'll ever do in your garden. And then like humans, we spread those seeds just about everywhere you could. And some would say the plants did that on purpose, right? The right. evolutionary adaptations, these guys, they know what they're doing. It's not an accident. Every single thing that you see on a plant nowadays, for the most part, with an adaptation to respond 
to an environmental pressure so that it can continue its progeny and survive. So I always like to say the next time you're in your garden or in your yard and you see this happening, instead of being like, oh my God, it's just through weeds everywhere. You can stop and say, oh my God, look at the adaptation that plant taught itself how to fly. That's incredible. <laughs> right? you know? So we want to look at seeds as something more than just you know, a little bean in a bag. It's, it's this incredible potential packed into a tiny little package just waiting for its opportunity to germinate. Now, I like to play a little game with my classes and that is name that food, which is how much has food changed to the point that maybe we don't even recognize it. So what we're looking here is something that we call teosinte, right? A couple of small kernels, almost un unrecognizable to its modern predecessor, you know, which nowadays we have something like this corn, glass gym corn, right? So from this tiny little kernel, you know, somewhere in, you know, central Mexico, it was adapted over 8,000 years to turn into this beautiful thing that we get to plant in our gardens today that we get to experience. I love it when people see these because most of the time they're just in a, in a complete amazement. They're not, they've never seen food like this. Or how about this one? This one's almost a giveaway because it looks like it. You know, and this one, this one kind of showed up really around India originally in that region, the Indus Valley, and then work its way into China. This is our modern eggplant. I was going to say it looks like an egg. I know, I know. I almost think it looks more like an eggplant with the original than what we see nowadays. Or this one, a little root, grows actually here in Colorado as well. And then over long periods of time, which this kind of made its way out of, you know, around Iran, modern day Iran and Afghanistan. These are our carrots, you know. It's pretty amazing to see, and, and, and there's already even in carrots, there's so much variation without getting sidetracked, you know, or these ones here, chiltepines. These are our modern day peppers, right? These guys showed up somewhere in South Central America. They're part of that, you know, equatorial group of plants like potatoes and tobacco and, and tomatoes. But all of these plants started as something else than what you experience today. And what you experience today is because somebody or some buddies over long periods of time selected those, those things about that fruit that they wanted it to, to possess. And that's, that's why we have these opportunities to have such an abundance of food. Now, if you're looking at this and you're thinking, man, I really do want to save my seeds. This is really cool. Awesome. Your next question is probably, oh my God, where do I start? <laughs> so I had the same look when I first started. I thought, oh my God, there's so much I need to know. And what I want to do is encourage you, if you're watching this, you don't need to know that much. Over time, you'll learn it because you'll become interested in it. But you can start this year. You can start right away. And I always like to recommend some simple, quick ones to start with. These five easy seeds are probably some of the best to start saving. And this is because, one, they're an open pollinated seed, right? They're going to, you don't want to save hybrids maybe at this point. You can do that, but this is probably not the time for it. So you want an open pollinated hybrid, or I'm sorry, an open pollinated heirloom seed. And things like beans, tomatoes, peas, peppers, lettuce, these are really easy seeds to save in your garden. And this is because they're what we call a self-pollinator or a selfer. And, and that, just, that just basically means that they provide their own pollen and they do everything they need to so that when you save the seed you know, from that tomato, the next year when you plant it, you're gonna get the same tomato that you originally had. And you don't have to worry about it cross-pollinating with anything else. Now, with time, you can up your game here. You can learn more about cross-pollinating and things like squash and you know, these uh, corn and things like that. Those are, those are great to learn about. But what I want you to do is focus on these easy ones so that the first few years you do this, you feel successful. You want to feel good about what you're doing. You don't want to feel like you're being defeated by the process. It's important to remember a few things. Your mistakes are edible. At worst, it might not taste good, but you can eat it. You don't need a lab coat. You don't need to be a professional to do this. Many popular varieties that you see in magazines nowadays were mistakes. They were an accident that turned out to be something amazing. And most importantly, you will always have more to learn. I always joke with people that if you feel like you've learned everything in gardening, you have not been challenged enough. Nature <laughs> is just waiting around the corner to give you a new lesson. Right. And so again, just real quick, we have those self-pollinating and those cross-pollinating plants. Focus on those self-pollinators, those selfers. Those are the ones that are going to make it easy for you to save seeds, feel successful about it, get to plant something next year, and actually kind of see what your hard work turns into. I would recommend a few good books. Um, of course, Bill McDormand has the basic seed saving guide. I keep this one in my backpack. It's perfect for traveling with. It's not too big. It has all the basic standard stuff you need, all the terminology, all those things you might want to learn about. 
The one in the middle there, that's Seeds by Thor Hansen. I, that's not a book that you're going to learn how to save seed from, but I found it incredibly fascinating. It was a great book. Uh, really did a good job unpacking the importance of seeds and the impact uh, it's had on us as a, you know, a culture and as a society. And then The Seed Garden by Seed Savers Exchange. This is a great book. It's, it's a big one. I keep it on the bookshelf. It's the one I come back to when I need to look up a plant I don't know about. You don't have to know every seed that you might need to save and, and don't think that you need to. You always have resources you can come back to. Now, my next recommendation would be to step it up one and join the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and sign up for a seed class. Maybe you need to get some seeds. You can look at the Great American Seed Up and get yourself a whole bunch of seeds for probably the best price you're going to find anywhere. And at the same time, if you feel like you need to keep learning, you can always sign up with Greg at the Urban Farmer. Uh, he's always working with Bill and these organizations. They're great opportunities for you to learn great opportunities for you to expand upon and join a community that wants to see you succeed. We need more seed savers. I'm gonna end with a little writing that I actually read this morning that I found to be incredibly beautiful. And this is by Cynthia Acelli. It says, for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, the insides come out and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. And I love this because it's how I think of us as in the veteran community. We wow. are the seeds. So yeah. take that. Uh, I hope you found some of this uh, inspirational. Maybe you learned a couple quick small things. It's been my pleasure. My last bit of advice, I tell everybody this, nobody just gets a green thumb. You have to kill a bunch of stuff to earn it. So <laughs> That is the case. I tell people all the time, I've killed more stuff than you ever will probably. I think every good gardener has. Uh, yeah, you have purpose. to learn to be okay with it. Yeah. yeah no, exactly. it's never on purpose. And uh, there's a few that hurt a little bit more than others, but it's definitely how you learn. Yeah. And how do we get a hold of your organization? So if somebody wanted to make a donation, hint, hint, they could do that. You bet. That would be great. We would appreciate that. We're a small nonprofit and we work really hard with the, with the resources that we have. You can reach us at veteranstofarmers.org and learn a little bit about more of our mission and what we do there, as well as you can use that platform, our website to make donations. And if you aren't in a position to make a donation, you know, at bare minimum, if you have any veteran family or friends and they're looking at trying to figure out how to play with the plants, send them our way. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your input today. You bet, Greg. It's been great to get a chance to, to be here. I, I look forward to hanging out in the future, hopefully in person eventually. Right. Excellent. Thanks. Wow. <clears throat> yes, uh, Dina said, beautiful quote, brought, my, brought a tear to my eye. It did for me too, choked me up a little bit. That was uh, incredible. <clears throat> I think we're going to have to replay that, Catherine, if you want to send me an email, at greg at urbanfarm.org, I can uh, track down that, uh, where that quote came from. So, Greg, yeah. can I ask you a quick, quick question? <laughs> Please. I noticed several questions in the chat about where do they, where do people learn? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need Bill. There you go. Go ahead. Go, Bill. We're asking questions about soil health and how to learn about soil health, especially in the Arizona uh, area and the in the um, metro, mm -hmm. metropolitan mm -hmm. Phoenix area. And I, if I'm not mistaken, didn't I see that you're having a chat with Emily Rocky on seed health next week that I want to attend? Yes. Drip irrigation. Yes. So just a quick. Chance yes. For that. Yes. So if you want to know about, uh, if you want to know about healthy soil, Emily Rocky is an amazing resource for that. And she is on our seed chat this coming Tuesday, seed chat dot, uh, garden chat. I'm sorry. She's on our garden chat, garden chat.org. You can go sign up and you can hear, hear her there. All right, Mr. McDormand, we are going to uh, jump in and go for about 15 minutes or so on wild seeds. So, uh, and then we'll take questions after that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. And just go ahead and go. Is my screen up and okay? You are good to go, man. Well, as Greg mentioned, this is one of the most popular modules that we do. And uh, much to my surprise, I got into this because I wanted to save vegetable seeds. Then because of our overall diversity being uh, threatened, I thought that was a really high value for, for me to get involved with. But um, 
wild seeds do have their own uh, advantages. Um, that's me in the office, so to speak. <laughs> I collected um, 48 different species of Forbes and native grass seeds for about 23 years in the Sawtooth National Forest in Idaho where I grew up. And I learned a lot about how to do that, doing it, by doing it. So I just wanna encourage everybody from the beginning, if you're thinking about doing this, do it. It will teach you so many things about yourself and what's going on. I always like to start, people who know me um, know I like to do this. I like to start from a big picture. So I, I, was, my, I caught this quote by Eckhart Tolle in a book he wrote called The New Earth. And it really stopped me for a minute because I never really thought about it. But think about this, Earth 140 million years ago, one morning just after sunrise, the first flower ever to appear on the planet opens up to receive the rays of the sun. You know, life started from a single cell, we think, and it's just been complexifying and changing itself to adapt to new things. And we don't understand the whole mystery and reason of why all of that took place. but. We do know from fossil record about 140 million years ago, the first flowers showed up. Well, why is that important to us? Because every flowering plant has seeds and we're seed people now. So everywhere you go all over the planet, no matter where you are, sidewalk in New York, in a crack with, with planting growing up, wherever you are, every time you see a flower producing plant, there are seeds. So learn to look for those seeds. Um, not You may not always uh, even recognize what they look like or the containers that, that contain them look like, but start looking. And it'll be, it's kind of like just happened to me with bird watching. Never really looked at birds, but now that I'm a bird watcher, I'm starting to see them everywhere. And it's just really a wonderful sort of awakening. And I think if you are interested in wild um, plants and wild seeds, you're not alone. I think there's a huge revolution that's coming. We're changing our diets. I mean, look at how big the gluten-free section is in your local supermarket if you need actual proof. And, and I realized one day that everybody who's changing their diet for their own health reason, personal health reasons, but also for the health of the planet to move away from the industrialization of our food system, they also want to treat their yards better. They want to do things differently. We're looking for a new landscape that's not lawn and is not chemical. So that, and lots of times that discussion leads to native plants or wild plants. And there've been a lot of different talk, a lot of talk over the last 30 years about uh, what kind of landscape do we do then? You know, xeriscape was a term uh, developed by the Denver Water Department to save water in the metropolitan area of Denver. Um, we've, uh, you know, the organic um, Movement's been really big on landscapes. Um, native landscape is also another term, and I'll talk about that. I finally threw up my hands one day at my little seed company when after answering question after question after question about this. And I finally, somebody said, well, what do you want, Bill? I kept telling them I didn't want what they were proposing. And I finally decided it was the reasonable landscape. I want one that doesn't take any water, doesn't take any maintenance, and I don't have to put any chemicals on it. And it's beautiful. And I've learned that you, we can do all of those things. And maybe the foundation or the key to it is learning how to recognize the seeds and wild plants and bringing those in your environment around you into your own yard. And so that one of the first questions that always come about, that's me about um, 25 years ago. I did uh, organized native plant, ed, native and edible plant walks for God, almost 40 years in my hometown. And when I first started, I didn't really know a lot. By the time I ended, I knew a lot because almost everybody who came on one of those walks taught me something. And, uh, and so I became sort of this local expert. And one of the questions that always came is like, should we even go out into the wild now? You know, uh, mankind's had such a deleterious effect on the environment. Maybe we should just leave it alone. And I, you know, I, I toyed with this question for a long time, tried to figure out what it meant to me. And what I finally realized is that our, the, the uh, American lawn and our American landscapes now are one of the most poisonous places in the world, literally. Just the, the millions of pounds of uh, herbicides and pesticides that we dump on them to keep them looking the way they are because they're artificial. They're not part of their local natural environments. And the only way we're gonna make a transition to make them better is if we have native plant materials. And there are no seeds available, relatively little. 
you just can't find them. And so in a sense, I, I, I took on this role of I'm like, you know, the squirrel or the bird or the animal that eats a fruit and goes somewhere else. I'm a disperser now, only I'm dispersing them in a little bit larger way. And I really think this is a hugely productive uh, enterprise to get involved in. In, in my area uh, where it's dry, um, sometimes a pensamon plant would drop a million seeds on the ground and there's no com carrying capacity for that. That's all surplus. Sure, a few bugs and a few animals might carry away some of it, but most of it was just became compost. So I figured if I could pick up a few of those and take them out into the world and help the world be less poisonous, that was a noble thing to do. And then I decided that I would never touch more than a third of the plants in any one area. You know, some people go, oh, well, I never touch half, but I don't even think we deserve half these days. I try to be really careful. So my own rule of thumb was go out, do it, do it mindfully and never touch them more than a third of the plants. And largely then what I run, have run into over the last 25 years are a lot of myths about what this means and what it could mean and how to do it. So I'm just going to go through some of these. My job today isn't to teach you how to do this as much as to get you on the road and, and maybe hook you up with some resources so you can. So, you know, the, the biggest myth is that you can put back a native landscape. And this drives a lot of the sales of native plant seeds. Even with the Forest Service and road departments, they scrape a new road in, they just said, well, when we get done, let's put out a contract for the seeds and put it back. It doesn't work like that. Nature never has worked like that. Plant succession is way more complicated than we give it. In my area, it's probably 100 to 200 years of soil building and interaction before an area can be returned back to its normal. And so you just can't put back a native landscape. So the coral areas, if you've got a lot, you're building a house, you're trying to um, have more native plants in your, uh, in your vicinity, whether it's a park or whatever, don't touch it. <laughs> leave it the way it is because once you open up Pandora's box there may be a hundred years worth of weed seeds there and all sorts of stuff and it will never naturally get back to where it was maybe in lifetimes and the first thing people th say is oh I'm going to bring in new topsoil to help <laughs> I've never seen and, and this was only, you know, I only had about, you know, 35 years of practical experience dealing with over a thousand rather large customers. And, and never once did I see topsoil work. Every time somebody brought in topsoil, they brought in weed seeds. And there's a good example of the sagebrush country in Idaho near my home. That's what it looked like. And then I was accused of bringing in weed seed. And, and because I, I planted that with some native seeds. And that's not what happened. And so you gotta be really careful with that. The other big myth, especially among Americans is that biocides are necessary. And by that, I mean uh, herbicides in this case, gotta kill everything off and start over. When you kill everything off, you're killing everything off. And that's all the microflora in the soil. And all that does is set this thing up so that what we call the pioneer species can come in. The weeds, like you saw in that last picture. So whenever you spray herbicides, you're actually setting yourself up for a situation where you're gonna need more herbicides and it's poisonous. So go to pesticides.org, read the fact sheets for what you're doing and you will be as horrified as I was. But the uh, safety data sheets that you get from normal um, uh, in pest providers or appliers are drawn up in the United States by the company that makes the pesticide or the herbicide. And so they're just not fully disclosing what the problems are. But if you go to pesticide.org, you can get a European, especially perspective laid over it. And you can see that things like human birth defects have been explored or whatever. So read those sheets before you ever use an herbicide again. And one of the other big myths is that wild seeds are organic. I'm an organic person now and I want wild seeds. It, it turns out that if you buy commercially available wild seeds, they could be the most herbicided um, product on the market. And there's a really good reason for that. You know, the, uh, the sale of, of uh, native forbs and native grass seeds have a different set of rules than vegetable seeds. And those rules state in almost every state now, right there, no noxious weeds. If there's any weed seed in a mix 
or in the seed that they're trying to sell you, they have to throw it away. It's no longer good as a product. And that's, you know, we can see how that works. If, if you plant a whole acre and there's only one weed seed that sprouts mm. in the middle and it goes to seed, there's hundreds of thousands of them all of a sudden. So they have no tolerance. And because of that no tolerance, everything's herbicided. Wild, see, there is no category that I know of, of organic wild seeds that people sell. I've never seen certified. If you see it, let me know. The other corollary to this is that wild seeds need little or no care. That's why I'm going to plant them. They take care of themselves in nature. I'll just put them in my yard and I'll have color forever. I mean, that's I'm almost quoting literally a product called Meadow in a Can that came up about 30 years ago. Plant these seeds and you're done. You'll just have a beautiful yard. And almost this is almost the opposite of what happens when you plant wild seeds. You're still going through a new plant succession. Things are changing. Remember that 200 years I talked about that it might take to stabilize? You are on Mr. Toad's wild ride whenever you plant wild seeds. Half of them might not even germinate for years. That's their way of protecting themselves in the wild. Excuse me. Still on. I am? You yeah. can still hear me? Oh, yeah, you're still All on. All right. Um, oh, yeah, we can you're still on a hear you. I'm on a roll. <laughs> and so, um, and the other half of them um, germinate too well. There's so many wild seeds that will just take over your yard. That's why they're wild still. People have learned to leave them out into nature. So when you buy wild seeds, especially in mix, you have to question either they're going to be really difficult to take care of or they're going to turn into weeds in your yard. And in fact, many of the noxious weeds, many noxious weeds on noxious weed lists in many states in the United States got into those states and got out of control because of wildflower seed mixes. So just be careful with that. It's not that they need little or no care. You gotta be on the ball when you plant them. And then the church of the native will say you, save you. And I heard this over and over. People said, oh, well, I'll just go native plants. Then I'm, then I'm taken care of. And, and there's some problems with that. One is that you'd have to send your lilacs home, right? Lilacs are not a native plant in North America. And people say, but I love my lilacs. They smell so good. They never cause any trouble. Exactly. Mankind's been moving around the planet, humankind, and bringing plants and planting things that are good. So let's not just throw out the baby in the bathwater. Let's learn not to bring in noxious weeds. Let's learn not to have plants in our environments that cause real problems, but let's use the plant life that we have. Let's get really intelligent. Let's make native where we start a discussion about our yards and not where we end it, all right? Sure, we want native plants. We wanna learn a lot about it, but it's gonna take a lot longer than we think and probably be a lot harder. And that will actually make us better. We're gonna, through using wild seeds, we're gonna reframe our approach to the environment, to everything. This is our modern mind meets complex biological problem. I, I don't know how many dot-com millionaires tried to hire me as a landscaper and say, hey, we just wanna put it back. We, we just built a 20,000 square foot house. We ruined the whole landscape. Now we wanna put it back. And we know, Bill, we're conscious. We want it to be native. And I would say, no, you can't. And they say, oh no, you don't care. We don't care what it costs. We wanna put it back. And I would say, you don't understand. We don't know how to do it. We've never done this before. It takes hundreds of years to figure out this problem. We're the pioneers. We get to make all the mistakes you want. So when people, before they would hire me, they would have to understand that, that I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I may have a 35 year list of what not to do because they're all the mistakes I made, but we're together going on an adventure and trying to figure out how to do this. And that state of mind is what we need for everything we're doing as we learn to re-inhabit this planet. So manage for diversity wherever you are. The strength of any ecosystem is its diversity. So if you're gonna put wild plants in your yard, put as many different kinds as you can. Local, local, local is the best source of information for how to do this, find a local landscaper with 30 or 40 years experience and you will find gold. Somebody who has already made all the mistakes. 
you, this isn't in the agencies like the BLM or the Forest Service. Those people rotate through too fast. It's not in academia. Those guys narrow down in their PhDs into subjects so narrow, they don't have any practical application. Of course, I am generalizing, but where, what, where I've always found gold is in local. And then get online. There's an online wild seed market. You can find out all about seeds and people that do, are doing this thing all over the planet. It's a free uh, native seed network. It was put up by the BLM as part of a project they were paid for years ago. So that, I use that to try to find out what I'm doing. And all else fails, I get online, plants.usda.gov, where the US government has centralized all of its plant information. Great resource, I use that almost weekly. Your local native plant society could be a place where that you find lots of information also. Really hard to tell what a seed looks like in a plant if there's no flower there. Our whole taxonomy set up around um, identifying plants from their flowers. But there are some references out there. Here's one. And then I invite you just to start looking. Here's a penstemon. That's what the flower looks like. That's what the seed pod looks like. There's another one. You can go through all the plants in your area. Start with the flowers that you see and know around you and learn how to identify flower, seed pot. And I think I'll end it right there. So thank you very much. Awesome, awesome, Bill. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we're gonna bring in, uh, did we lose Kari? We might have lost Kari. We're gonna bring in Belle and Janice. Um, and we're gonna take some questions. Uh, there's been some questions about the seed bundles and uh, everything's working okay on the shopping cart, Janice? Yes, I um, added the inventory that we just received yesterday and I bundled it up. So that is updated and it has fixed the items that are now available. Cool, cool, cool. Huey, so go ahead and shoot us questions in the Q&A. We're here to answer your questions. Uh, there's still over 200 of you out there listening, so thank you much. I do see a raised hand uh, in the uh, question part, and we actually don't take questions that way because there's not we're not always we can't always count on the technology that is going to work on your end. So if you can put them in your questions in the Q and A, that would be great. You Huey don't. says there is a lot of glyphosate. Roundup use in my area. What does that do to the seeds, Bill? You know, it doesn't do a whole lot of damage to seeds directly. You know, so um, it's real danger is in the environment itself. When I was on the board of ANCAP, um, the Northwest Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides, we commissioned a study on of the Madison River in Montana and found molecules of glyphosate a hundred miles away on this trout stream within a day. Yeah, just remember that biosphere is perfectly, you know, <laughs> you know, hooked together. And that no matter what you do in one place, it ends up everywhere. And we're spraying so much glyphosate now in Montana, it's contaminating crops and it's in the rain. And so, you know, there's no measurable difference to how seeds are performing around that. It's kind of my answer, but we should be concerned about glyphosate for a lot of different reasons. Very. Yeah. Yeah. And w when I get this question from people, I always say, you know, we live on a, on a very polluted planet. I don't believe that we can go anywhere on the planet and have, and not find pollution. And interestingly enough, uh, I just recently read an article that they had found plastic micro pro micro particles in glacier ice in I think it was the Antarctic. Oh, that's heartbreaking. So, yeah. I, so really, what we can do is the you know we can just do the best we can do. Jody says glyphosate is in the groundwater in Napa too. Just not surprising. Can I jump in with a, another quick comment? on uh, plastics, plastics. Yeah, uh, yeah. saw a comment about why are we using plastic to send our seeds? Can we use an alternative? I'd be willing to pay for it is what uh, I think it, I don't remember exactly who it was, but yeah. I want everybody to know it's something we been grapple looking. with constantly looking at the cellulose yeah. bags, looking at paper bags, trying to keep the costs down. And maybe that's just something we should put out to people. Are you willing to pay more? You know, although that creates a little bit of a 
logistics. Yeah, logistics um, roadblock for us. But please know that it's foremost on our minds and we constantly look at yeah. ways to, to be uh, cognizant of our whole uh, cycle. Actually, that's one really nice thing to say is we have had feedback and input from our participants in our live event and also participants in the online events who have sent in some fabulous ideas. We do take these ideas to heart mm -hmm. and then we work on trying to get them implemented. So some of the best ideas we've had are not ours. Right, we're an, we're an open source team, bring it on. <laughs> well, and I, I kind of see ourselves as a transition. How do we get from a place where 99% of American gardeners don't save their seeds to a place, get back two generations where everybody yeah. does. Right. Yeah. And so we're just seeding this process. We're getting as much out as we can. When I was Good in Siberia, pun. <laughs> I know, right? When I was in Siberia, um, I went to an annual seed exchange and everybody got all their seeds there for the year. So everybody came mm -hmm. to a big potluck dinner and brought the seeds they saved and brought a, a, a meal for the dinner. Everybody stuck around for four or five hours, talked to everybody that had all the different kinds of seats they needed. And they passed them out in these perfectly folded up little newspaper packets they all made themselves. There was no plastic. If we make seed saving local the way it should be, so it's adapted to where it is, we don't need plastic. That's just part of a leftover from an industrial system I see that we're trying to get away from. Oh, I can totally see a bigger savings in our bundles if we have an option to reduce the little bags. Because right now we send out our bundles with the 10 PPBs and has all the cards and has the seeds. But then in addition to all of that, we send all the little bags so that our recipients can bag them for themselves. Maybe we just have an option to reduce all the little bags and they won't even send it. I'm gonna look into seeing how I can make that work. You better, uh, so you can't do an acronym on these people, Janice. They're gonna go, <laughs> you. They're gonna gonna go TPB, sideways TPB. like that. <laughs> TPB, what is a TPB? <laughs> what you is a TPB? Okay, a TPB is like that big bag that Greg held up of the, um, the Swiss chard or mm -hmm. an, any other seed that we send out. It comes out in a, bag that has 10 portions in the bag. So a TPB is a 10 portion bag that you get to divide up into your 10 little portions. Yeah, and they're not always little. No. They're not always little. 10 so, little portions. You know, you know, on riches, did you have something, Bell? Um, I, I was just wondering, well, I'm, I might be jumping the gun here, but I know that people are wanting to probably move on to other things. Not that we're not interesting, it's not you know important information. Um, I was just wondering, do we have specials <laughs> with our <laughs> seat up in a box bundles this, this time? I hope we do. <laughs> well, okay, so the seat up in a box itself is already greatly reduced. So yeah, um, there's- special. There. It is a huge value for what you are getting compared to what you would get anywhere else. But anybody who gets the seat up in a box gets a flyer inside and has the information on where they get access and all access pass to our today's events and last seat up um, in set up, seat up Saturday's events. And just so people know, yeah. um, interestingly, it's all different. The whole thing's different. We try to keep these really fresh. So all the material is different. It's seed storage, it's seed saving, it's basics. It's yeah, good. Yeah, we've got lots and lots of information. So what's included with your purchase today is access to today's event recording, the February event recording. Um, it includes uh, over 30 seed chat class recordings. We do a monthly seed chat. Uh, plus, there's other videos that are included that from our when we used to do live events. Uh, so your bonus today, number one, is you get this amazing bag of seeds that basically nets out to about 60 cents per packet of seeds, per jumbo packet of seeds, and all the education. Remember up front, we said we're about education first. There you have it. I've got a decision that I think you guys will love. 
anybody who wants to reduce the plastic in their order, if they put the comment in there, please remove the plastic bags, which will only remove the little portion because obviously we, we've already, we have to send the seeds in something, but the repackaging bags will be removed from the order and we'll put something else in instead to make a bonus. All right, that's gonna be your job to figure out what that is. Exactly, I'll figure something uh -huh. out. So we have an anonymous attendee. Why, why can't I just get one portion rather than the 10 portion? She just has a small, she he's, has, just has a small garden. The reason you can't is because it's a seed packing issue. Um, you know, if we have to package individual packets of seeds, it takes 10 times longer. So, so, and the price would go up. So just with Great American Seed Up, uh, just like with Great American Seed Up, where you're doing your own packaging, that's what we're doing with you is we're giving you an opportunity to buy seeds super, super cheap because we don't have to pay the labor to get them packaged up into small packets. That's why uh, anonymous attendee, we can't, you don't get a one pack. That's why you only get a 10 pack. But if you bundle up with your friends on Facebook, on church, uh, on your neighbors near down the, up and down the street, um, at your farmer's market, find a few people grouped together. We had one lady who had like maybe four friends who were interested in doing it and they bundled up together. They uh, did a purchase together. And then she commented on Facebook that she's doing this. She ended up having to come back to us and said, I had so many people reach out to me. I, I need another well, box. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, oh, Grace. Rachel, says, Rachel says, can we pick them up locally? Yes, you absolutely can pick them up locally. And that uh, option is available on the cart. And the option is available on the cart. Um, will I get the bonus if I order during the week? Yes. So the bonus um, is good through middle of the week next week. So, or something like that. Um, uh, Yes, Grace says your bundles could start a seed library. That's part of the point. Start your own seed library and pass them out. So um, really this whole thing started with a conversation with <coughs> Bill McDormand and I in 2011. And here's, here's what happened. Bill, how do, we, how do we revolutionize? How do we stock up the local seed economy? He says, Greg, we need a seed bank. So I went out and bought a thousand pounds of seeds. I think I had about 60 different varieties of seeds and I bought a freezer and I put them in the freezer and I, then I went back to Bill and I said, okay, Bill, there you go. And then it was like, okay, well that didn't solve the problem. It just started a bigger one because there's 4.5 million people in Phoenix and we need to activate them, not activate my space. So uh, Bill and Bell and I were having a conversation Thanksgiving about, I don't know, seven years ago and in about 15 minutes, we created the Great American Seed Up. And the whole point of the Great American Seed Up is to get the local food and the local seed economy activated with seeds, with open pollinated seeds, with inexpensive seeds. So that literally when you come to the Great American Seed Up, if you spend $50, you have enough seeds for the rest of your life, which means that if you buy a, a of one of our bundles and split it by 10. You have enough seeds for the rest of your life because not only do you buy seeds and get started with growing them locally, we teach you how to save your own seeds so that you're saving your seeds down the line and not having to buy seeds again. And I love what Jillian said in her talk. She said, if, uh, if people saving seeds put me out of business, I would consider that a huge win. I would consider that a huge win too. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we do, did you have something, Bill? Bill? Um, just if uh, somebody wanted to know about a, a live uh, Great American Seed Up event. Oh yeah, we don't know at this yeah, point. We're still sitting on the fence. Um, probably 2022 for the live event. So. I think logistics um, with as popular as this seat up in a box has become and transitioning from that to a live event 
but there's still too many variables that are, are going to be uh, making it a difficult transition for this year um, that we can mm -hmm. safely say uh, 2022 is much more likely than 2021 for yeah. a live event yeah. locally. Exactly. Uh, Dina wants to know, and this was probably for you, Bill, looking for Roselle, any thoughts on where to purchase it? Maybe Bill can figure that, or Bill can figure that out. Uh, Annette, uh, Annette says, "Will you consider continue seed up in a box?" Yes, because our whole intent when we started the Great American Seed Up back seven years ago was that we could figure out how that we could give the give the process to other people in a uh, franchise kind of an idea. So rather than doing the full franchise, what we did is we just put together seed up in a box, and you can do your own and. You know, we could actually see people, you know, buying a 10 pack or a hundred pack or a thousand pack of seeds. Um, so, yay, thanks for that. Um, yes, uh, the see. names of the seeds are included in the box. Uh, not only can you see the names of the list on the list as you are ordering, when you mm -hmm. get your shipment, they're all broken down by name, by list, and on the cards, like Greg's showing right there. Each card has its own identifying uh, for yes. the particular seed cultivar it is. Oh, yeah. We've thought through that. Well, okay. Truth of the matter is that Janice thought through most of this. So over the past five years as she's been playing in this arena, she has made things move so smoothly. So thank you for that, Janice. Well, the fun thing about what I do is you all are what if kind of people. And I'm the right. systems person. So when you guys create this puzzle, I sit there at this table like, ooh, more puzzle pieces to fit in. <laughs> I just make it <laughs> right. work. Yeah. So uh, Dina wants to know, are the seed varieties for us here in Phoenix area or for all over the country? Uh, you want to yes. address that, Bill? Yes. Uh, first of all, you can get Roselle at Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Oh yeah, Southern Exposure is an amazing organization. For the rest of you who don't under, uh, know, uh, it's a kind of hibiscus, mm. red mm. flowers. Oh, right, 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 right. 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 So that would explain why a lot of people haven't heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I earlier, if you were on, I explained a little bit about where the word land race came from. And so um, that's all the, the mass of genetic material it took humankind, you know, uh, to develop from wild plants over 10,000 years, though, since the birth of agriculture, all done without anybody ever going to a university to study breeding, all adapted to a place, uh, and only so because of cultural, you know, um, connections, religious even. And so out of all of that, um, because of the immigrants that came to this country that brought the best of what they could when they came, especially the wheats, you know, we know stories of Turkey Red and Red Fife, you know, making America the bread basket. There's lots of stories of that. Because of that, that's what we started our agriculture in the United States with. And that evolved with people growing and saving their own seeds. In fact, every farmer and gardener saved their own seeds clear up through the 30s, probably 20s and 30s is when it started two generations ago. But there were uh, some really great varieties out of that that were taken clear up into the 50s and 60s, even 70s, and worked on and refined and further adapted. And a lot of that work was done by Heinz Corporation and Campbell's Soup and people that were um, trying to figure out how just to grow better tasting vegetables, you know, for their products. And um, so we even ended up with heirloom, what I would call heirloom superstars that had some disease resistance for even modern agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so out of all of that big picture, um, uh, we lost 90% of it, you know, in the last two generations, it just all collapsed and left. But of the stuff that's left, there's still treasures and they're still out there. And there's still just a few sources where people are growing these seeds in large enough quantities that we could put them together in packages and make the great American seed up work. So that's where the seeds come from. It took me 40 years bouncing around down blind alleys and talking to people, you know, in the seed business, I always thought I was always looking for the golden boulder, I called it. I would finally find the answer and I would roll this big rock over and every question I had would be answered. I would yeah. find the source to everything. And I never found it, just little ones. 
constantly frustrated that I couldn't get a question answered, but constantly amazed that I would get another little one answered. So you roll that together in a whole lifetime. And that's, I found enough seeds to put this together. That's my answer. So. Great. And the, the seeds that we picked will work in pretty much any climate. You just have to know when to plant them, right? Right. So you yes, know, that generally the older you go back into varieties, the more diversity is still left inside of them. And that diversity can help them adapt to cool. different places. And we know this is true because the whole vegetable market, you know, that especially the hybrid seed market that developed out of these varieties, mm -hmm. you know, they sell the same watermelon in Florida as they do in Montana. Does yeah. it really work better? No, but it works enough for them to get away with it, at least up to this yeah. point. Yeah. So what, what we want you right. to do is start with this really great gene pool the best that we can find and learn to start adapting it where you are. And then there'll be nothing that surpasses it. And, you know, in the future, um, my vision is that all these people that are buying these bundles and starting their own seed, seed ups are then starting that process where they are. And pretty soon they won't need us. Great. Yeah. That's what we're, that's our goal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, here's the thing. In my front yard right now, I have cowpeas coming up, and I have it was, cowpeas were something I uh, purchased at Native Seed Search about 10, 10, 15 years ago, and they just come back year after year after year. And we harvest, and, and they're great nitrogen fixers, and they're shading for the ground. So for my fruit tree program, um, I give them away. And people are always like, wow, you give away seeds because they work well with fruit trees and the, the whole process. But I grow enough cow peas every year that I just, I, I have enough to give away. People want to buy them. It's like, I don't sell them. I give them away. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. So we got a bunch of questions here. Let's see if we can get through them. Uh, Riker says, uh, didn't see any potatoes or strawberries. We don't do potatoes or strawberries in this one. Local is local to Phoenix. So local, local is uh, pickup would be in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, uh, Shez says, thank you, Bell. I heard Greg describe how the, to put the bags in a jar with a solid lid and into the freezer. Are there any seeds that would not save in a seed in the freezer, Bill? Mm. <laughs> uh, maybe that Roselle <laughs> that we just talked about. You know, I don't know about tropical plants. So other than, you know, we don't sell that. All the stuff yeah. that we have, you can put in the freezer. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Um, Carol says, I'm a wannabe gardener. I have nothing going on currently. However, I found this event fascinating and informative. Thank you for your hard work and passion. You bet. Woo um, yes, we do ship to Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This is for Jennifer. Can I say um, something about that? Yeah, hold on one sec. Um, you can uh, send me an email and I can get you pricing. Go ahead, Janice. Well, basically, when you're looking for um, out of country, we do have the ability to uh, price that out on the cart. We had a request from somebody who said, hey, can you ship to Canada? And we hadn't had that set up yet. It takes a little bit of research to make sure that we've got the logistics down. Somebody else asked if they could send it to... Oh, it scrolled out. I can't see it, but it was Belize. out of the country. There's, Belize. There's, there's a Belize question, right? Right. One is have us to send it to Belize. So yes, we can look into that and you'd be yeah. working with, uh, we'd have to go through the, the, um, the agricultural rules that they have. Oh yeah. I see that Bill's uh, Dottie bill is typing that to you now. Uh, let's see here. Sue says I have stored seeds in pill boxes and jars, but left them in my deck box that goes into the garage over the freezing Canada winter and sits outside in spring to the fall. Uh, is this wise or not? Well, the garage is like a freezer, so that's good. Um, that just so it know. doesn't get above 80 in the summer. Yeah. Then I would say it's okay. And humidity, you know, make sure it's um, sealed so that right. it doesn't get too humid. The mantra is? Yeah, cool, dark, and dry. Cool, dark, and dry. Um, and I don't know that anybody knows what that exactly means. <laughs> well, but, um, but that's the point. It doesn't have to. Well, you know, so I just gave you one of the parameters. Keep it below 80. Yeah. 
Um, and, interesting. And below 22 percent humidity, right? And below 20 percent humidity. Yeah. Uh, Celia says, for a seed box, is there a group in Phoenix area I can join for a single portion? I don't have a network of five other people. Um, <clears throat> we had a lady that was in your same place and she posted on next door, right, Janice? Yeah, that's where she did. It was next door. Yeah, she posted on next that. door what she wanted to do and then she had to come by, back and get more seeds. So that's, you know, that's a possibility. Celia, you can also reach out on the Urban Farm Facebook group and see if anybody else is interested. Um, that's one of the things that we allow you to make your connections so that we um, aren't doing it because that would be an expense that we don't, we just don't have the time to manage. Yeah. You know, um, if you have a particular seed variety that you are interested in, you can always send in a suggestion, uh, Janice at greatamericanseedup.org. I will take, that's my email. Um, we will gather those up and then uh, Bill will do the research to see if it's available. So yeah, we've been adding, definitely adding to our list of available seeds and available cool. countries. So if you, I see several people um, and unfortunately we had an issue uh, last uh, seed up Saturday where somebody was uh, um, not doing nice things inside the chat room. And so we had to unfortunately make it so that you can't talk to each other. We apologize greatly. But if you do email Janice, for those of you, Carrie says she can, she can send Celia a, a bundle. Um, so it, maybe just coordinate that through Janice at Janice at urbanfarm.org. Because if you send Janice an email, it's and you Janice at it? greatamericanseedup.org. Yeah, I got that, but you wrote in the- uh, I did not. Uh, uh, in the chat, Janice at urbanfarm.org. So both will work actually. They both go to the same place, but uh, um, maybe Janice can put you all together. Um, all righty. So um, I think we're about the lady who was up. asking, uh, Celia, reach out to me because we do have another participant who is willing to help you. So yeah, there um, you go. Gotta love Celia, it. reach out to me. Um, Patricia, there's one more Rachel, question here. This, Rachel, perfect. Um, Patricia says, this question is a follow up to your info, how to harvest seeds from pods of Totsway and kale. Thank you, Belle. Can I also put out uh, the plants and hang them upside down until the pods are brown? Uh, they're in raised beds and I would like to make room for more plants. At what point in the life cycle do I pull the plants? I guess that would be for Bill. Hmm. Well, leave them as long as you can. And if you do pull them, pull the whole plants and hang them upside down. And the way brassicas work is that some seeds start to form into pods and mature before others. So you may not get a lot of them. So if it were me, I would wait until you see the pods on the lowest part of the plant start to dry and brown and maybe even crack a few of those open. And that means about 80% of it, you may even have yellow flowers at the top and then mm -hmm. every stage in between. So once the ones at the bottom start to dry and crack, you can pull the whole plant, turn it upside down and some of the next of them will have been mature enough and they'll mature over the next couple of weeks. So good luck with that. You'll get some seeds that work. You know, on this, um, we have a fabulous annual plan for our seed chats. We just talked about cuc cucurbits. Uh, in June, we're going to be talking about wildflowers. And in July, we're going to be talking about brassicas. So don't forget to join our seed chats for more information specific to those vegetables. Cool. Uh, Lisa says, thanks so much for everything. She's a community gardener at Agritopia. She wants more cow peas. Um, <laughs> so, and more uh, cowbell just, while you're at it. <laughs> yeah, more cowbell, more cowbell. I was going there too. <laughs> more cowbell, um, please. So just send me an email, greg at urbanfarm.org and we can figure that out, Lisa. It's a Saturday Night Live reference. It's oh, oh yes, right. More <laughs> <laughs> if I'm you haven't watched it recently, do so. It is so funny. <laughs> Just the type cowbell, in YouTube, uh, just type cowbell. Yeah, and it comes up first, right? Um, let's see here. 
Uh, Pug says, thank you all from Eugene, Oregon. Anonymous says, thanks for all of your dedication, passion, and years of hard work. We appreciate you. Patricia says, thank you. Um, uh, Leticia, I got your email. I'll respond. Uh, go to greatamericanseedup.org and um, buy yourself some fun seeds to share with your world. Um, any I last thoughts? Go I have ahead, a request. Um, mm -hmm. The Urban Farm is trying to uh, make a name for ourselves on Google. So if you have enjoyed this presentation, please go to Google, look us up, Urban Farm U, and leave a little review. It, uh, it helps us oh, get found. Um, can you put that, can you find that and put it in the chat, Janice? Oh, I have several times and uh, TW just did again. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, if you could review this, because this is an Urban Farm U event today, sponsored by the Great American Seed Up, and then the seeds are coming from the Great American Seed Up. So um, last thoughts, Bill? Um, people all over the planet are shortening their supply lines for food for a number of reasons, whether they're political yeah. or ecological, the climate change or whatever. People are realizing that we're really vulnerable. Yes. And underneath that, then, lo the localization of our food supply has got to be the seeds. If you don't have local seeds, you're not going to have a local food supply eventually. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's magical when you do that because it does adapt. It is easier. You don't need the chemicals. Those are things I really believe. And so get involved in this. And if you think our industrial system saved enough diversity in seed banks or whatever, you know, so that we'll be okay, then you're... Uh, hugely misinformed. Nobody has the money to get all the seeds that have been saved back out and to grow them out again. It's just not going to happen. Nobody is coming to help us. If we are going to do this, it has to be grassroots. It has to be you and me, little seed savers. We're the only ones that can do that. We're the only ones that have ever done that grown and saved the seeds and adapted them locally. We can afford to. If we get off types, we can eat them. We're still gardening. If a, if a large farmer does that, he's out of business. So rightfully, this is what we should be talking about. And, and we're just stretching every bit of our being to tr try to figure out how to get millions of people to do this. And that's what this Great American Seed Up is all about. If you've got a better idea about how in a market-based monopolistic consumer society, to get people to save seeds, let us know because you know we're we're trying on all cylinders just to get that to go. And I really believe that that um, getting seeds from farm almost farm direct, without yeah. any packaging, and no metal people to you, in this way is the best way that we figured out to do it. It's the cheapest way to do it. So, good luck, everybody. Thank you. I really respect that you showed the interest to come on today, and uh, that's why we're Anytime. here. So. And many thanks on to Facebook, go ahead, go ahead. to our friends on Facebook. Um, we had uh, uh, Renee over there working that for us. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Wow. Bell, last thoughts, Bell? I can't cap Bill McDormand. He's got the, he's got the final word. His, you know, we did get one really good question. Uh, Ewing says, is there a trick to letting plants go to seed for collection without that plant seeding the rest of your garden bed? <laughs> To be continued. Uh, <laughs> We're excellent. on time. We are on time. You know, Benjamin Farr talked about something called um, edge rows. So as soon as something does start to go to seed, uh, move it to the outside of your garden. In many cases, you know, um, that you can do that. You can just get it out of the way and replant it in a different location. So mm -hmm. that might be part of the answer. It's a beautiful day in Arizona. It's time to get outside and garden. We're having a cool wave. Nice. You know, so here's my one takeaway. Okay. Rich said, oh my God, that plant just learned how to fly. <laughs> he said that as he was showing a picture of the puffball flying. Oh gosh. <laughs> yes. That's a flipping miracle. That is a miracle. Oh, I miracle. love that. Thank you all for joining hey. us. Please, please support us in our crazy dream with buying a seed box. We'll get it shipped out to you this week or next week um, and tell your friends, post a uh, review on Google for Urban Farm U, please. And um, 
We love you guys. Thanks for doing the work you're doing out there. Keep it up. We'll see you in August. <laughs>